All righty, on the count of three, let's give them that clap. A One, clap, not the clap. Yeah, it's not chlamydia. <laughs> One, two, three. Welcome to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're so glad you're here. As always, I am your host, Lauren Ash. And as always, I am joined by my co-hostess with the most S, Christy Oxborough. How you doing? I'm still a piece of garbage. <laughs> <laughs> I am mentally on another planet. And I... <laughs> I may spend the rest of this episode uh, just talking in TikTok sounds, you know, like I got, I am, oof, like this was a, I, we had talked about recording this yesterday, yeah. and then the day before I was like, oof, I don't know if I'm going to get it done, and you messaged me first and asked if we could push, and I was like, oh, yeah, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> And then today I was like, oh, yeah, I really, I really got to finish that off, huh? And it's just, it was just been a wild ride of, I don't know, the last 13 hours of my life trying to get this done. And uh, I'm there, but I'm frantic. Like my brain is on eight different planets right now. Yeah. I think. So, I get that. Yeah, so that. all I hear rolling through my head is like I'm flipping through reels or TikTok, but I just hear the sounds. But I know sure. they're just the sounds in my own mind. So that's great. Well, I mean, I sure, yeah. The soundtrack of our madness. I mean, I think that mine's usually yeah. like, uh, you know, a, a, a faucet that's dripping that I just can't find. Um, the sound of my madness last night, the soundtrack of my madness was 3 a.m. I'm awoken to the sound of dishes uh, cl cl clattering in the sink. And I go, it's Sharky. It's the cat. It's fine. Is it? Nope. He was at the foot of the bed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was oh. terrifying. I was, I was like, now I have to get up. I have to find bravery, I suppose. <sighs> oh, you're so braver I, than you think. Well, I grabbed two of my hidden pepper sprays and I went to the kitchen and... <laughs> Mm -hmm. I had not done dishes at, after dinner. I just left them and they, I guess they were just kind of precarious and they, they slipped. So everything was fine. But yeah, I was just, oh. it was, I mean, that's not, that's not anything I, I want or need. You know, a 3 a.m. wake up that no. you try and blame on the cat and then realize immediately, nope, not him. Yeah, I get that. I get that. The other night as we were falling asleep, apparently he was already asleep. I was not. I heard a loud thump. Our children had long since been asleep. The cats were in the basement. So I was like, what was what was that? Like to the point where I startled and out loud said, what was that? And so I waited for him to be like, I don't know, verify. He also heard the sound, whatever. He just said nothing back and was sleeping. And so my brain was like, okay, there may or may not be someone in the house. So I handled it like an adult, and I burrowed into that bed in the hopes that if they came in the room, they'd find him first. <laughs> sure. Yeah. yeah. That's just honest. That's just honesty. <laughs> you know what? Again, I'm on another planet. You know what story uh, Leslie Seidler, friend of the podcast, reminded me of that I had completely forgotten? Do you remember um, when I was dating the guy and I was living in Toronto? And uh, I was living in an apartment and someone owned it. And then they were like, we're going to sell it. Like I was renting from them. We're going to sell it. So you yeah. have to move, which is always such a slap in the face. Yeah. Um, but they were having showings where they'd have like a realtor come and, and show potential new new buyers the, the apartment. But there was one day and uh, they had not alerted me that someone was coming. And it was, you know, skyrocket in flight afternoon delight happening. And as that's happening, we hear people enter the apartment. And I'm like, and keep in mind, this is downtown Toronto. These apartments are very small. And, uh, and he, he quivered and was like, oh, no. <laughs> like, and hid under the blanket. And I was like, we have to deal with this. Um, that was uh, the beginning of the end. <laughs> Forgive me, because I feel like the people want to know, like, full nude. We were fully having intercourse, and people... Okay. Well, yeah, that yeah, yeah. doesn't necessarily mean 
many things. Sometimes you're fast and a shirt stays on. Sure. I don't know. I'm just Fair saying. point. So full nude. Fair point, yes. Full naked. Yeah. Wow. How did you handle that? Did you have to like go out there in a robe and be like, five minutes and close um, the door? Like- I, I, well, there wouldn't have been enough time because again, by the time you like would come around the corner, you'd be able to see through down the, the rest of the apartment into my bedroom. So I just yelled and I was like, they didn't tell me about this. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, we're sorry, we're sorry. And they left. Uh, but for me, I just would have liked to have seen some sort of like spring into action, you know, instead of just uh, uh, pulling the duvet over his head and quivering. That that felt unhelpful. This was the same one who we he had told me that he had agreed, <laughs> we had agreed that we were going to move in together. And then he, he decided at the last minute not to. And he said, and I quote, yeah, I tried on the coat of moving in together and it fit, but I just couldn't get it zipped up all the way. What the fuck does that even mean? <laughs> and I, I think I, I, I think I literally went, "What the fuck is that, man?" <laughs> yeah. That's outrageous. Yes. And last, last one on that one. Uh, same one who uh, I was in Toronto. I come to LA for uh, work, and before I left, it was a few days mm-hmm. before Valentine's Day. I gave him Valentine's gifts. Mm-hmm. And then I'm in LA for Valentine's Day, and I'm like, surely he'll send flowers. Mm-mm. Nope. Nothing arrives. And I was like, he, okay. He made up for it. Oh, sure. He was flying in a few days later, I think on the 16th. So he arrived, and I was like, here we go. And then he's like, what? And I was like, did you have anything you wanted to give me? And he was like, what are you talking about? And then the answer was no. And then he's like, I'll go get you something now. And I was like, that defeats the purpose. And he was like, no, just let me go. And I was like, I don't need it now. It's just, it's over. It's fine. Of course, he insists. He goes across the street from the hotel into the only store that I think sold anything. Came back. He had two items. One was a cookbook that was called What the Fuck's for Dinner. And the other item was an iPad case. And I did not own an iPad. (laughs) (laughs) Ah. Yeah. 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 I mean, look, I did not meet that one. You didn't. You in didn't. particular, and I don't feel bad about it now. No, no, no. It was for the best. It, did, well, it didn't last that long. It was for the best. It was for the best. Yeah. <laughs> God. I mean, if that if that man is listening to this show, he's not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But in, in the story I'm writing. Sure. In my uh, in my noggin, Google. Yep. Um, I am thinking he has spent years kicking himself for what a fool, and s- he sits there listening to our show, focusing deeply on just your voice, and zipping and unzipping a coat. <laughs> Yeah, no, he moved on fairly quickly after me and had a baby with somebody, so I don't think that I'm on his mind. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. God, I wonder how that worked when she gave him the news. Was he like, "Mm, I put on the pants of having a child. (laughs) Couldn't get him done up. Like, what a weird... What I know. A, no, I was like, don't give it. me a metaphor right now. Like, no. we, we had already gotten a new place. Like, it, it, like it was, yeah, it was a mess. But anyway, uh, you know, I got a million of them. I got a million of uh, the fun, the fun, uh, the not fun, fun stories. So uh, that's just one of them. But I had forgotten about that. I had forgotten about that detail of him quivering under the blanket. Um, yeah, that's just, uh, those are the fun. It's fun to rediscover your own traumas. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, and then share them with the world, you know, look, I'm an open book. Um, of course. What you drinking over there? Oh, um, I'm just, I'm going to say a Palm Bay, but I need you to know that I was going to say, say it to the tune of Taylor Swift's Bad Blood. Because I'm drinking a Pompe. That? Yeah. Yeah, I was. But I dialed it back. <laughs> because I'm like, I can't be too nuts off the top. Or people I are going to be like, oh, built no. built a brand being nuts off the top. <laughs> so 
<laughs> yeah, that's that's accurate. Yeah, that's accurate. Uh, I just felt like I'd already started with TikTok, and so I was like, oh. And then going to Taylor, I'm like, let's give them some time because ah, she's universal though. She's not just I, TikTok. Oh, it's true. I uh, I, I just I'm like maybe I'll give them a small break from me because I don't know what's gonna happen in this because even though I finished these. 10 minutes ago um i don't know what's in there and that's the well that's the fun part yeah because once i hit print i think it leaves my brain and prints on a paper yep oh my god does that really happen stop it <laughs> no it doesn't really happen that way maybe i don't know where's the science everywhere show I me can. the proof but show me the proof yeah i know show me the receipts yeah That'd well, be the, nice. the good news is, is that dry January has started over here. I'm on water. Um, I, I, oh, I just, I went for it over the weekend. No, yeah. I went, I went for it on Friday and I paid for it over the weekend and I'm ready mm -hmm. to take some time, uh, as I like to do early in the year, just to say I can. Um, so yeah, we'll see how that goes. Uh, <laughs> man, oh man, just a maniac. Um, but you know, again, you got to you got to cross the line to know where it is. You got to get your yayas out. Uh, yeah. Now, listen. Before we get into the case uh, for this episode, I do just have to mention very quickly. Obviously, last week we were marking the you know very sad passing of one uh, icon, Miss Betty White, and we've had two celebrity deaths since then because they always come in threes. It always oh, happens. Oh yeah, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Oh. So you know, shout out again, Sydney Poitier, like none other, trailblazer. Yeah icon wildly talented beloved um you know huge loss and bob saget who also oh. very beloved i have not heard prior to this or since obviously this i've never heard anyone say anything negative about him um and again some of the stories that are being shared now are so beautiful about how he was just oh. so lovely and really cared about people um and was spreading love uh, to those in his life and all of the above. So um, a toast to the to the trifecta we've had in the past week, oh. and may it stop now. That'd be great. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and then also Robert Durst died, uh, made famous from uh, documentary series The Jinx, and for him yeah. I don't feel as much. <laughs> ah! uh, he is my second least favorite. No, he is my first least favorite Durst. Who's the um, first? Well, I was thinking he was the worst, but no, no, I was thinking he wasn't the worst, but no, no, he is my least favorite Durst. I can't believe which... you're not saying worst Durst. <laughs> <laughs> I should be. He is the worst Durst, um, which says a lot when Limp Biscuit exists. And wow. I am allowed to say that because I was a huge fan back in the day. Huge. Like, you wouldn't think it, but, oh, I, I, my, like, emo phase went quickly into, like, Limp Biscuit, Corn, Deftones, that kind of thing, uh, where I think I frightened myself briefly. I think I was almost goth without the makeup. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's a vibe ah! almost goth without the makeup that's i like that yeah i like i would like buy pants brand new and then like cut up the inner seam inseam and then reattach it with safety pins and mm. i felt like the baddest bitch in the world <laughs> i wasn't i wasn't at all uh, but I felt it, and yeah. somehow Limp Biscuit understood that. Well, they did it all for the nookie. Thank you. <laughs> I actually shouldn't say anything negative about Fred Durst. Has he done anything negative? We don't know as of this moment, and by we, I mean you and I, because I'm sure the world does, but I am not oh, up to I'm date. I'm sure they do. Um, I feel like we would have heard more about it if he had. I also feel like given his level of fame at the time he probably did some stuff that wasn't great but i could be wrong i could be wrong oh oh yeah i mean my vote is for most likely there's like something 
in there's that a, history. There's at least a small trail of tears, I feel like. I'm sure at some concert or another, he has propositioned some teen girls for codeine. I don't know. <laughs> That's a that's callback. A, that's a that's callback. A, that's a deep callback. Yes. Uh, and no, I don't think that Fred Durst had anything to do with Cody. I'm no, no, no. Making no. a callback to when we to were propositioned to give a, a musician and Cody. Yeah, specifically yeah. Cody, which was very and very seems specific. so innocent now. Like not even weed. I'm not even looking for weed. He's looking for codeine, which feels... He wanted some Tylenol 3s. <laughs> he, was... wanted, he wanted a reasonable you know? painkiller. <laughs> yeah. Oh, a legal, well. reasonable painkiller. Yeah. Oh, But I guess you did need to have a prescription for those. So maybe I shouldn't be yeah. scoffing at prescription drugs, Lauren. Th- that's, that's shame on me. Oh, I still think it's shame on him for asking us. True. True. But good for us for being like, okay... We need to leave. Yeah, we need to get out of here. This was charming until the requests for codeine came out. Yeah. And then, yeah. hey, you girls want free shirts? Come get in the RV. We're like, no. We did get in that RV. Did we? I don't yes. remember that. We got the shirts. <laughs> well, I remember getting the shirts. I don't remember going to the RV. I thought he went in and oh, brought maybe. the shirts out. Maybe we said, no, we're not getting in there. We, I think you... once we got to it, we were like, oh, it's a legit RV. Oh, boy. Ah, uh, no. What was that band like, called? Ran. Generation. Yes. That's right. I kept thinking the band was called Government for years. But I had a shirt and it <laughs> did not say Government. Anyway, both good names. But the Government is the place where we went to see that band. I don't remember which. I, I think it would have been. Oh, I don't know which band it would have been. The Used? Probably The Used. When we were yelling at the young gals in line, where are your coats? <laughs> it's freezing out here. That was Boxcar Racer. Opener was the used. That's there it we, is. That's there you where go. we met uh, Mike from Buffalo. Mike from Buffalo is on the line. He was <laughs> working this redhead hard. And I'm talking about Christy Lynn over there. <laughs> um, uh, that was also where I met Burt McCracken, lead singer of the used. Remember that? Yeah, that was the first time that we had heard the used. That's right. And we were taken, hooked immediately. Hooked. So into it. Yeah. It just uh, never stopped. When you can and you won't and you don't stop. It always happens. Constant playlist of songs. Um, listen, let's get into it. We're talking about Bob Crane in this episode of the show. And I got to say, as I mentioned at the end of the last episode uh, of the last episode, I don't know anything about this man or this case. And I just briefly skimmed what I'm about to read. And I was like, go, go, go. <laughs> so, uh, short answer. I'm excited. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm excited. I'm jazzed because it seems, I'll say it, titillating. Oh, nice. Titillating. Nice. Um, let's get into it. In the late 1960s, actor Bob Crane was introduced to the world as Colonel Robert Hogan in the sitcom Hogan's Heroes. As audiences fell in love with Hogan's charm and quick wit, they came to see Crane and his on-screen persona as one and the same. But after Crane was found brutally murdered in the summer of 1978, fans soon learned that not only did Bob Crane have a serious sex addiction, but that he also used to film and photograph all of his sexual encounters. Did this hidden lifestyle lead to Crane's death, or is it just a red herring? And if so, who murdered Bob Crane? Police believe that it was a close friend of Crane's, but Crane's own son believes that the killer might just be one of his father's ex-wives. Reporting for True Crime and Cocktails, (laughs) Christy Oxborough. Christy? Not gonna lie, don't remember a word of that. <laughs> She's unwell. It's who she is. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna go into it and we're gonna attempt to make it a romp. It's gonna be a romp, like the Glee curse. If you haven't listened to that episode, check it out. Uh, oh, I can't force a romp. They have to happen organically. Yes. All right. So. Alfred and Rosemary Crane got married in 1925. Alfred was described as nice and soft-spoken. 
and Rosemary was said to be sweet and especially lovely. And maybe things were different at home behind closed doors because I read that the nice and soft-spoken man once believed that his wife was cheating on him, so he would sneak home from work and hide in the bushes to try and catch her with the milkman. Mm. And that is going to take us to a very early TV trope side note. Hello. <laughs> I don't know why we as a society ever had to start this whole your wife is cheating while you're away at work. But can we just stop? Jokes about this scenario have been around since people were getting ice deliveries before electric refrigerators became common in the 1930s. The electric refrigerator was invented in 1913, but it took several years before they were a common feature in homes. Huh. And it doesn't stop at the milkman because it turned into the mailman or a traveling salesman or repairman or delivery man. And the occupation varies depending on the part of the world. Apparently, in Spain, the joke involves a butine butinero, which is a delivery man who brings bottles of gas used to fuel stoves and heat homes before the majority of Spain connected to a gas line. I'm not a naive enough to think this situation has never happened in real life, but the belief your wife is cheating on you simply because you're not home says a lot more about you than it does about your wife. Moving on! <laughs> <laughs> I like so, it. So, Al and Rose welcomed their first son, Alfred John, in May 1926, and just over two years later, Robert Edward Crane was born July 28, 1928, in Waterbury, Connecticut. For reasons that I'm unsure of, the Crane family moved around a lot, so much so that between 1930 and 1942, the family moved at least eight different times. Ooh. But despite the repeated moves, Robert, better known as Bob, was always a fairly popular kid, which seemed to start around the time that Bob got into drumming. His father, Al, gifted Bob his very first snare drum at Christmas in 1938. Al purchased the drum in Stamford for $23 and asked Vito, the store's owner, to hold it until Christmas. But when Al returned right before Christmas, he learned the drum had been sold to someone else. But Al wasn't willing to leave empty-handed. Al said, quote, I promised my boy a drum for Christmas, and by the holy saints of Ireland, he's going to have one. So Al looked around the store, walked over to a drum that was $75, and picked it up and walked out. <laughs> I'm getting a real picture yeah. about uh, Bob Crane's dad. <laughs> yeah. uh, Vito said that he felt bad for what happened about the first drum, so he just looked the other way. Years later, when Bob Crane became famous, Vito hung a picture of him from Hogan's Heroes in his store. On the picture, Vito had written, quote, I, Vito am responsible for the show business career of Bob Crane, star of TV, radio, and movies. <laughs> also get also, a real clear view of Vito's Vito. personality. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because, I mean, spoiler alert, I don't think I would have said movies. <laughs> Neither here nor there. Was he in a movie? Yeah. Can we uh, also attribute his know? television career to his drumming? I mean, I don't know the answer to that, but... Well, we, we get into the drumming, but it's just it's such a weird like obviously because of me because of a fuck up i made at work <laughs> <laughs> i am responsible for that career. that was just such a wild yeah it's a leap wild thing and uh he's being cute now, though he he wants to make it like a conversation starter yeah yeah oh a hundred percent and so you know what veto for us it's a conversation ender <laughs> Yeah, I should have looked. I should have looked into Vito if I'd thought about it and had time. But curious where he is now. The fact that this was 1938, <laughs> I have some guesses. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, I also, a quick aside, uh, spent so much of this time looking into uh, Bob and the drumming and stuff because it was such a huge part of his life. I could not stop thinking about Dave Grohl. Like it was hard. Like I. It was very similar to like the opening in uh, Dave Grohl's book where he's talking about him getting started and falling in love with drumming and like drumming all the time and Bob talking about it. It was like the same kind of thing. And I'm like, ah, oh, it just got its hooks in them. 
and so I couldn't stop thinking about it. Maybe that's why it took me so long to write my notes, because my mind kept wandering. Anyhow, Bob's interest in drumming increased even more in 1939 after he saw Gene Krupa at the World's Fair. Forgive me if I have missaid that name, because I'm about to do it again. Musician side note! According to Wikipedia, Gene Krupa was an American jazz drummer known for his energetic style and showmanship. Many believe that Krupa's solo on Benny Goodman's 1937 recording of Sing 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 changed the role of drummer from an accompanying line to a separate solo voice in the band. Modern Drummer magazine considered Krupa to be the founding father of the modern drum set. Oh boy, I'm not 100% on this pronunciation either. Heaven help me. Krupa collaborated with the company Zilgian uh, to develop the modern hi-hat cymbals, as well as to standardize the names and uses of the ride cymbal, crash cymbal, and splash cymbal. He was also one of the first jazz drummers to use a bass drum in a recording session in December 1927. In fact, one of his bass drums, which is inscribed with the initials of both Krupa and Benny Goodman, is preserved at the Smithsonian. And one more thing before I move on. Did you know that Zilgian, who sells drumstick cymbals and drum accessories, was founded in 1623 in Constantinople? In Constantinople. In Constantinople. Right? And so you understand why this was hard to do notes, because my brain is singing all the, all the way through this episode. Well, now you uh, know what it's like <laughs> to live every day in my head. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's exhausting sometimes. You know? Every day. Yeah. Every day. Yeah. Uh, the company is currently located in Massachusetts, where they have been manufacturing symbols since 1928. Mm. So when Bob Crane was about 10 or 11, he sees this famous musician perform and is absolutely blown away. Bob Crane biographer Carol M. Ford said that this point in his life, quote, music and drums were as much a part of him as breathing. In high school, Bob was practicing for hours on end. Not only did he play snare drum and timpani in the Stamford, Stamford High School Orchestra, but he also played snare drum in the school's marching band and was the leader of his own jazz band. Bob wanted desperately to become a professional musician, but his parents felt that it was no more than just a pipe dream. But that wouldn't stop Bob's passion for music as he would play the drums throughout the remainder of his life. When Bob was 14, he, oh, here we go again with names I can't fully pronounce. I'm so sorry in advance. When Bob was 14, he met Anne Turgeon. Uh, in a later interview, Bob said, quote, I was playing second base for the baseball team, and she was riding her bicycle and bumped into me. And boy, did I fall for her. Bit of a pun, but I'll accept it. Yeah. Uh, Anne was described as a reserved, quiet girl with a terrific personality and, quote, pretty in a plain sort of way which isn't the nicest compliment so boo to whoever described her like that yeah Anne was immediately supportive of bob's musical ambitions often missing out on school dances and parties because bob was off playing gigs and honestly it was just the beginning of a long history of Anne being beyond supportive of bob even when maybe he didn't deserve it but more on that later mm. While in high school, Bob played for the Connecticut Symphony Orchestra. In the mid-1940s, the orchestra was struggling to find musicians due to financial difficulties. So the orchestra filled their vacant spots with students from nearby high schools. Bob played timpani for the orchestra from 1944 to 1946, as well as with the Norwalk Symphony Orchestra. Oh, it is said that Bob was removed from the Connecticut Symphony Orchestra for adding jazz flourishes to classical pieces, but others say it was because he made a joke that the conductor didn't appreciate. I don't know which is true, but either way, he was removed. Right. On June 5th, 1946, Bob graduated from high school, and two years later, in June 1948, Bob proposed to Anne just weeks before she graduated from high school. Around that same time, Bob was looking for a way to volunteer in the military, but he was terrified of being drafted. So on June 21st, 1948, Bob met with an enlistment officer and joined the Stamford National Guard. Bob served with the National Guard for two years, rising from the rank of private up to corporal. 
he even took part in like field training for fun which is not my idea of fun neither field nor training are any yeah. part of the idea of my idea of fun but either way teach their own yeah on May 21st, 1949, Bob and Anne were married in a Roman Catholic church in Stamford. At the time, the bride and groom were 18 and 20, respectively. Afterward, the couple honeymooned in the Poconos, which is in Pennsylvania, and also a lot of fun to say. <laughs> Bob and Anne traveled to the Poconos with another newlywed couple who had been married at the same church just an hour before the Cranes, and who also happened just happened to be staying at the same hotel in the Poconos, which is such a weird coincidence that it's like, I guess we're travel buddies, and they all just traveled together. At the time, Bob made a living playing in various jazz bands in Fairfield County, but just months after the wedding, he completed a radio techniques course at the University of Bridgeport. He applied at various radio stations, but didn't get any word back until March 1950, when Bob received a phone call from a new radio station called WLEA. The station had started just two years before and was located in Hornell, New York. Bob jumped at the chance to put his new course skills to work, so he left the National Guard with an honorary discharge, packed up his car, and drove to Hornell, 309 miles or 498 kilometers away. Since the newlyweds didn't have much money, Anne remained at home with her parents. On his trip to New York, Bob's car broke down and he was picked up by a farmer who took Bob the rest of the way in a wagon pulled by a horse. When Bob finally arrived at WLEA, he found out that he wasn't hired as an on-air announcer, but rather as the station's maintenance man. Soon after he started, the station ended up offering Bob the announcer job anyway. Apparently, Bob and 50 other announcers had applied for the job. But the station believed that the big city applicants wouldn't be happy with a small town station. So they decided to hire the only applicant that was not from a big city. And that applicant was Bob Crane. Huh. A month later, Bob was promoted to program. Program. Ooh, what was that? <laughs> program. <laughs> program director. Uh, he also made an additional additional money at the local Elks Lodge three nights a week. While Bob was away, Anne took a secretary job to support her parents, but the distance was putting a strain on their new marriage, and the couple considered getting a divorce. It got to the point where Bob started to see a woman in Hornell. But that relationship came to an end as Bob and Anne got back together. Oh. Shortly after the couple reunited, Anne's father, Alex, passed away unexpectedly in August 1950 following surgery complications. He was just 49 years old. Oh. This left Anne as the sole source of income in the home, so they briefly debated about, about Bob leaving his job and moving home. But before he could make the move, Bob was offered another job. During his time at WLEA, Bob sent out audition tapes to various radio stations throughout the Northeast. In December 1950, Bob was offered a position at WBIS in Bristol, Connecticut. And since his family was in a dire financial situation, this would conveniently put Bob closer to home, so he took the job. The only problem was, when Bob arrived at the station, he wasn't at all what the managers had expected. It turns out that when they were listening to his audition tape, the manager's recorder was set at the wrong speed, and they played back the tape slower, making Bob's voice sound deeper than it really was. <laughs> Bob said, quote, when he heard me speak, he was pretty disappointed, but he liked my sense of humor, so he kept me on. I just can't imagine going to a job where they're like, hey, we hired you for your voice, and you show up and you speak, and they're like, damn, what's wrong with you? And it's like, oh, no, that's... That's on you. But wow, that's amazing to me. But after three short months, Bob moved on to WLIZ in Bridge Bridgeport, Connecticut, before being transferred to WICC. By February 1952, he was promoted to program manager. And by March 1953, he was promoted to operations manager. During his time at WICC, his radio show was described as, quote, unique, exciting, entertaining, and fun. He pushed the envelope and took chances, then learned to be careful and think twice about how far he could actually take a joke. 
Soon the cranes moved from Stamford to Bridgeport, and on June 27, 1951, they welcomed Robert David Crane, known as Bobby Jr. Despite how well the Bob Crane show was doing on WICC, Bob wanted to break into a bigger market, so he continued to send out audition tapes, and in 1956, he got an opportunity he was looking for. Bob signed off for the last time on WICC on August 11, 1956, and on September 3rd, he made his morning debut at KNX Radio in Los Angeles. Bob's new show was more than just records. He'd also throw in random drum solos and some comedy voice tracks. Bob eventually came to be known as King of the L.A. Airwaves, and in 1959, an L.A. Times journalist dubbed him, quote, Man of a Thousand Voices. Huh. Soon, the Bob Crane Show was so popular that KNX requested that Bob add live celebrity interviews to his show in the fall of 1958. During this time at KNX, Bob interviewed thousands of people on the air, and we do not have time to get into all of them, of course. These are just some of my favorites. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> uh, I don't know why. These are just the names that popped out of a very long list that I went through. John Aston, Jane Mansfield, Bob Newhart, Marilyn Monroe, Natalie Wood, Dick Van Dyke, Phyllis Diller, and the absolute queen herself, Miss Julie Andrews. Mm. The Crane family settled into life on the West Coast, and in late 1958, Anne learned that she was pregnant with the couple's second child. So to celebrate, Bob and Anne went to see the movie Tunnel of Love, which had just opened. When they were leaving the theater, Anne commented that one of the characters in the movie reminded her of Bob. And that was the first moment that Bob Crane ever considered acting. Oh, no. Yep. <laughs> on June 19th, 1959, the couple welcomed Deborah Ann, and just three months later in September 1959, Bob tried his hand at acting at in the Valley Playhouse production of Tunnel of Love, the very movie that inspired his latest ambition. He advertised the play heavily on his radio show, telling listeners that he was, quote, a celebrity in one field about to lay an egg in another. About to lay an egg. Yeah. yeah. I should have advertised this show that way. <laughs> you may know me from Superstore, but I'm about to lay an egg in this podcast realm. <laughs> I, uh, I, I like it, you know? Yeah. Uh, and despite how self-deprecating Bob was, the critics were surprisingly positive, And that just lit the fire under Bob even more. However, KNX was not interested in losing their heavy hitter to Hollywood. In fact, Bob's first contract with KNX included a clause that prevented him from acting professionally for five years. It's a radio station in L.A., of course. They're going to have a don't act professionally clause. It just makes sense to me. Yeah. Uh, Bob spent long days at KNX, but he also took time to prep his show and also had public appearances, theater rehearsals, and now two children at home. His schedule was so hectic, to say the least, Later in life, his son called his father a workaholic, saying, quote, I don't understand when he slept or ate. The amount of prep work he did for his shows was just amazing, preparing dozens of sound effects that he would play throughout the show. Then the family welcomed a second daughter named Karen Leslie on November 29th, 1960. So at this point, Bob is chomping at the bit to pursue his new passion of acting. And in 1961, KNX finally agreed to renegotiate Bob's contract. Soon he was showing up in episodes of The Twilight Zone and The Alfred Hitchcock Hour. Then on December 26, 1962, Bob made a guest, guest performance on The Dick Van Dyke Show. Less than two weeks later, on January 7, 1963, Bob was contacted to guest star on The Donna Reed Show. In fact, Donna Reed herself called Bob personally to invite him. On March 14, 1963, the episode aired with Bob as Dr. Dave Blevins, and he was so well-liked on the show by both the cast and the audience that they asked him to come back as a recurring character. Uh, Donna's neighbor, Dr. Dave Kelsey, who I believe is a different Dr. Dave than the first Dr. Dave he played. Interesting choice. Uh, Bob was one of two actors who were considered for the part. The other... A name you might recognize, 
egregious Philbin. How about it? Now, he, How about he it? didn't lay an egg in the acting world. <laughs> That's true. That's He's, true. He stuck to his uh, interviewing, I feel like, no? Or, or journalism or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I think he went to, like, host and then was, like, realized that was where he shone and was and, like, this is where I'm going to stay. And let me say, what a gift. Yes. Yes. Um, also, for reasons, because I'm frantic and I'm everywhere all at the same time, shout out to a young Dick Van Dyke. <laughs> Blanche, everybody. Welcome, Blanche. <laughs> nice to see you. We haven't oh, seen I... you in some time. Yeah, look. I watched Mary Poppins a lot as a child, and I know it's because I think the world of Julie Andrews, and I know now I had a deep crush on Bert. <laughs> he was so full of joy. He was. He was the epitome of, let's go. Yep. And you're like, hey, you want to do this? He's like, absolutely. Yep. He's on board. You wanna, He's on board. You want to go fly a kite? Yes, he does. You want to jump in this painting and go into a magical world where... Who knows if we're going to be able to get out? Yes, he does. Yeah. I'm just saying, oh, my yeah. God, if they could make a Mary Poppins Matrix mashup, Christy, stop it. What is that even? They I go mean, into the painting and then it's. I just oh, feel I like there's know. an image of them like tap dancing on the rooftops and then like doing all the like bullet, like uh, avoiding, you know what I mean? Like I back bends. Would, I would like that a lot. Yeah. And not just Dick Van Dyke doing back bends. What that is doesn't matter. Doesn't yep. matter. 100%. Bob Crane. So, <laughs> oh, so Bob signed a two-year contract, and on April fourth, nineteen sixty-three, his new character made his debut in an episode entitled "Friends and Neighbors." But after sixty-three episodes, Bob had grown bored with the character and wanted to branch out and try something new. So he asked to leave the series at the end of the second season. The character wasn't written off, but rather just no longer seen he would be mentioned all the time like oh i'll talk to my husband dave about that <laughs> but just never seen on camera oh. bob continued with community theater and a small role in the movie new interns which was released june 1st 1964 and i'm gonna say it i know that i'm not an actor but i can't imagine someone who is like huh i think i want to try acting and then a few years later is given a contract to be a series regular on a popular TV show and then go, ah, this is boring. I'd like out. That's ballsy to me. <laughs> you know, like that feels like, wow. Okay. Yeah. I, I yeah. would, I would, I would suggest that perhaps yeah. because there was not a struggle to become an actor that he did not necessarily value how mm -hmm. hard it is to get those jobs and how much he should maybe value that job or be grateful for that job. That a would lack of my... appreciation. Got yeah, it. which, listen, is mm -hmm. not necessarily even his fault. It's just his the situation was is that he kind of got it put in his lap. So then it was like, oh, if it's that easy, then I can get a million of these. And it, it's not that easy. Um, yeah. Oh, don't worry. He finds that out. <laughs> I, I'm, mm. I'm waiting for that shoe to drop because yeah. – that's a it tale will. as old as time. <laughs> oh, shout out to Angela Lansbury. May what we? A gem. What a gem. So then the moment came in December 1964 that changed Bob's life forever. Bob was given the chance to audition for the pilot of an upcoming sitcom. Bob screen tested for the role of Colonel Robert E. Hogan, a role that fans would later say Bob was born to play. In January 1965, cast and crew began to film the pilot for the series Hogan's Heroes. But given the amount of time that it takes to film a TV show, Bob knew that he had to let go of his radio show to completely pursue acting. Bob remained at KNX from September 1956 to August 1965. He was considered to be a broadcasting genius who called his show, quote, innovative, cutting edge, and way ahead of his time. Weeks after his final radio show, Hogan's Heroes made its primetime debut September 17th, 1965. And right out the gate, this show was a huge hit, which is surprising, especially when you realize the show is set in a fictional Nazi prisoner of war camp at the height of World War II. 
going to just say this right now. I've never seen Hogan's Heroes, and you've yeah. just blown my mind. I had no idea it's, that that's what it was about. It's a comedy. Of course it is. It's, uh, I mean, I did read, I didn't put this in my notes, but I did read um, that the uh, casting uh, for every single person who played a Nazi on the show, they specifically chose a Jewish actor. To try and be like a like an F U to the Nazis? I assume as much. Okay. It was okay. A, it was okay. It was related to me in like a very positive way. I I, I listen, I like that I like that uh spirit. Yeah. I feel yeah. like for, for many of uh I, I don't wanna i I'm not Jewish, I'm not gonna speak for Jewish people, but I feel like mm -hmm. that could also be be traumatizing for oh, for them. One of the cast members <laughs> was in a concentration camp and lost his entire family in a concentration camp. Oh my and god. He he played one of the prisoners on the show. Again, it was a comedy, so they didn't really focus on the negative stuff, and I'm fairly certain the Nazis were very bumbling. I didn't see any of it. I should have seen at least an episode before this. But um I knew it was something about war. Yeah. And I was like, oh yeah, I watch MASH all the time. No, different vibe, different vibe. Um so and then I read that it's got Nazis and oh boy. Yeah. Ha. Huh. Yeah, yeah. I've just written in my notes, watch Hogan's Heroes, question <laughs> mark. I mean, I need to see this. This just feels like, well, listen, I mean, it feels like, yeah. um, it feels like this was probably also used in the pitch for MASH. It was because MASH was Vietnam, right? Yes. I mean, to me, I, I don't even know. Like, yeah. it, I just want to know who pitched it. And who was like, oh, yeah, hilarious. Because we're talking 60s, so, like, there's going to be that canned audience laughter. And it's yeah. like, if two Nazis run into each other, do you hear, like, a boink? Like, is there, like, a weird, like, silly sound effect for things? Like, I don't know. Different people, time. Different people time. People love the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To this day, they still love it, so... Again, I'm gonna have to see I don't what know. all the, the all the fuss is about. We gotta we gotta watch the pilot at least. We gotta give yep. the pilot a try. Yep. So Bob was excited to finally get the chance that he had been waiting for. He would even collect newspaper clippings about the show and put them in leather bound scrapbooks, where he also kept notes on how well each episode did in the ratings. Fun fact, side note. Something that many might not know is that Bob Crane actually played percussion on the theme song for Hogan's Heroes. Oh. Bob's drumming was also included in two episodes of the show, one episode in season one and the series finale in season six. During the show's run, Bob filmed the 1968 comedy The Wicked Dreams of Paula Schultz, followed by a TV adaptation of Arsenic and Old Lace but it was Bob's role as Colonel Hogan that audiences would remember him for. Also, quick aside, I love that these are things I don't remember to write in the notes, but I remember them from reading and feel compelled. Yeah. Uh, I read that people were like, just saw him and Colonel Hogan as just like interchangeable to the point where so many people would be like, oh God, he's the same person. So then instead of taking it as like, any sort of compliment he took it as an oh so people don't think i'm acting they think i'm just showing up and being myself so then it just like pissed him off to even consider it's like they don't even know i'm working and it's like i get it man nobody knows the effort that goes in bob crane <laughs> i'm just saying i'm just saying yeah also a teacher in the eighth grade grade eight uh made us watch arsenic and old lace i don't think it was this version i think it was like the movie from like the 20s or 30s or something it was black and white i still to this day don't know why because <laughs> i'm odd choice pretty sure it was music class huh so then it was like was that the wheel in a cart with the tv vcr day i don't know but we yeah. i just remember two sweet elderly women who i think are sisters maybe poisoning people yeah and getting a kick out of it. And I was just like, I really don't know why we're here. And it's been decades and I, I still don't. So, like all the best TV comedies, Hogan's Hero ran for six years 
from September 1965 to April 1971. Everyone involved with the show said that it was a dream show and that there was zero drama behind the scenes. I wouldn't say zero drama. Mm. For, for unknown reasons, it seems as though Bob and his fellow castmate Richard Dawson had some sort of falling out, like to the point where Dawson did not attend Bob's funeral. Oh. And that's surprising, as Richard Dawson was Bob's best man in his second wedding. Which Interesting. we'll get to. And while I don't know his reasons for not attending the funeral, it felt like that sent a message. Maybe I'm wrong and he just wasn't able to attend. Maybe I'm making something out of nothing. I don't know. But Richard Dawson, ladies and gentlemen. Didn't Richard Dawson also um, die by suicide? Uh, I think he just... (laughs) I love that I was just going to say... Who am I thinking of? he just died old. (laughs) Um... Uh, Ray Coombs. Sorry, was the, I uh, was always, the Family Feud host that always mix yeah. the two of them up. My bad. Keep going. Ignore no, it's, me. It's uh, Richard Dawson is the one who kissed every female contestant on the mouth. I do this constantly. I need to make. Yeah. I need to make a chart. Oh, there's enough Family Feud hosts that it, it takes a while. Yeah. So, I'm convinced that Richard Dawson and Bob Crane were very similar personality types, but instead of making them BFFs, it made them highly competitive with each other. I should point out, I have nothing to base this on, except for the fact that Bob seemed to be a bit of a ladies' man, which we'll get into. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think we can all remember episodes of Family Feud where Richard Dawson would kiss every (laughs) single female contestant on the mouth. And I know that I'll say we all when a large portion of our dear listeners are younger than us Mm -hmm. and probably have no clue who Richard Dawson is. And to that I say, go on YouTube, check out some of his episodes of The Feud. It's really something to see. Because no woman says no. Some women are, like, leaning in before he is. Like, it's, it's a thing he did. Every single woman. Does he look anything like Ray Coombs? Not even close. Oh, God damn it! <laughs> ah. When you think of, like, famous family feud hosts, well, I guess they all are. Yeah. Shit, was Richard Dawson the first one? I don't know. And then it was Ray Coombs and then Louis Anderson? Did Richard Dawson come mm-hmm. back a second time? Ah, shit, we're going to have to we're look, gonna up look it up. Family. We'll look it we're up. Gonna, we'll look it up. Yeah, we'll look up some family feud stuff and... We'll be back before you know it with that. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I know what you're thinking. At the time of Hogan's Heroes, and even up until his death, Bob Crane was seen as a charming family man. Audiences saw Colonel Hogan as a character who could do no wrong, or as Mary Poppins was once described, quote, practically perfect in every way. That was organic to mention Mary Poppins once again. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, And over the years, the line between Bob Crane and Robert E. Hogan began to blur, and audiences came to see Bob as the wisecracking, charming man who may stumble but would never fall. But after his death, the world got to see another side of Bob Crane, one that would change his public persona forever. Listen, we've already teed up what that's all about, so... (laughs) Yeah, um, yeah, we have. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, This is fascinating. Again, I love anything. Not that this is traditional old, old Hollywood. I guess it is old Hollywood. Um, Before our time. Yeah. Yeah. Anything in that time period is always fascinating to me. I am a big fan. Um, So listen, let's take a quick break. I want to get this break done and over with because I want to get into the juice. Um, I mean the juicy details. Not, not, I'm not talking about drinking anything. I don't need to over-explain this. I also need to Google Richard Dawson and Ray Coombs and this family feud fiasco because I need to know. I need to see what my brain remembers, you know? I put the notes down and immediately typed in family feud hosts in chronological order. (laughs) All right, listen. Grab a drink, hit the can, and when we come back through the magic of time and space, we're going to have an update on that too on this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. All right, here we go. Clap number two on three. 
One, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. Listen, we we learned a lot on the break, and the first thing is I've got to say shame on me. Shame on me. Richard Dawson and Ray Coombs could not be less alike. Completely different eras also, it feels like. Yeah, I have a feeling that, like, I think when I watched most of the feud, it would have been Ray Coombs. But yeah. the most popular one, obviously, aside from Steve Harvey, um, who does it now, uh, I think is Richard Dawson. You think Family Feud because he started it. Right. It's just... <sighs> I think it's just the fact that they both have R names and that makes me feel like honestly I'm becoming a Nana like that's (laughs) no I think um it's more of a Blanche thing to know what every male looks like (laughs) fair fair (laughs) that's where I'm at uh so do we give a list because I did find a list of the seven hosts yes of the show uh, coming in hot from 76 through 85. Wow. And then came back for a single season in 1994. So there you go. I knew that. Okay. Uh, Richard Dawson. Great. Who, again, I don't think I can stress this enough. There are, there's like a podium between him and the contestants. And they both have to lean to kiss each other. And... They never meet in the middle, so they have to, like, stick out their lips, like, two inches each. And it's amazing to watch because it's uncomfortable for everyone. Can especially and... the spouses of these women oh, who are just yeah. like, what are you doing? Wait, can I try and guess the rest of the hosts? Yes. Okay, number two. Oh, in order. Oh, God. Oh, oh, I get... okay, I won't be mean. In any... <laughs> in any order you'd like. Richard Dawson, Ray Coombs. Yes. Richard Carn. I had forgotten him, and that is on me. Louis Anderson. Yep. Steve Harvey. Yep. And there's two more. Mm-hmm. To, to be fair, the one of them hosted the Celebrity Family Feud, um, which apparently was a short-lived game show years ago. I believe well, they have since they brought, brought it back. back. Now. Yeah. But uh, this is like back. Was it yeah. Ellen? No, all men. Of course. Give me the other two. Uh, The celebrity host was Al Roker. Oh! And the host who did the show from 2006 to 2010, John O'Hurley. That's right. Yeah. That's the, yeah, I forgot about that one. I, I had forgotten. I know I did not say out loud Steve Harvey. When I was giving my list, in my head I said Steve Harvey, uh, but I apologize for not saying it out loud, but I had forgotten about John O'Hurley and Richard Karn, and I adore Richard Karn. I just think he comes across as so sweet yeah, just a pure, pure soul. Listen. Well, listen, speaking of people who may not be, um, I don't know. I don't know, but let's get back into all things Bob Crane. Of course, we left off with a great teaser, which was his public persona changing, and I cannot yeah. wait to hear more. Well, I'm going to say we're going to get into it, but I'm going to be honest. I was all over the place, so yeah, we're going to hold hands and we're going to do this together. Yep, let's jump. Now, before we get into the murder that you've all been waiting very patiently to hear about. I have to mention a few things about Bob's personal life that occurred during the making of Hogan's Heroes. The main villain on the show was Colonel Clink, whose secretary was Fraulein Helga. At first, for season one, Helga was played by Cynthia Lynn, who left the show at the end of the first season. But why did she leave the show? Well, apparently... Cynthia and Bob started to have an affair from January 1965 until the spring of 1966. Bob was still married to Anne at the time, and Cynthia was estranged from her own husband. Cynthia left the show in what she said was an attempt to save her own marriage. Three months later, Cynthia decided that her marriage was no longer worth saving, so she contacted producers at Hogan's Heroes to get her job back. 
Unfortunately for her, the role of Fräulein Helga had already been recast. Sigrid Valdis, whose real name was Patricia or Patty Olson, was to be not only the new Helga, but also Bob's next affair. Mm. Bob was also a huge advocate for Patty uh, as he pushed show creators to give her more screen time in later seasons. Mm -hmm. This second affair was the final nail in the coffin for Bob and Anne. She filed for legal separation April 7, 1969, which came as a huge shock to everyone who knew the Cranes, especially because Bob and Patty had kept their affair a secret, at least from the public. Anne filed for divorce six weeks later on May 13, 1969. In Anne's public petition, it is stated that, quote, The defendant, Robert Edward Crane, has treated plaintiff with extreme cruelty and has wrongfully and without reasonable excuse, cause, provocation, or justification inflicted upon plaintiff grievous mental suffering, which was has impaired her health and destroyed her happiness. Oh, my. Also in Anne's statements submitted to the Los Angeles County Superior Court, she claims that it was Bob who initially asked for a divorce. In an interview months later, Anne said, quote, Are you shocked that Bob and I are separated? Well, you're not as shocked as I am. Oh, really? Yeah. Anne also filed for a restraining order, stating that Bob's unplanned and unwanted visits to their home caused, quote, severe emotional upset and trauma for her and the children. The couple argued over the amount of alimony and child support payments, but the one thing they agreed on was the custody of the children. Bob was allowed reasonable visitations, but was more than happy to leave sole custody of the children with Anne. Ugh. Now that his relationship with Patty was public, Bob got her added to the cast of a stage production of Cactus Flower that he was starring in over the summer of 1969. And while I want to applaud him for being so supportive of Patty's career, as a wife, I can't applaud for someone who repeatedly cheated on their spouse. Mm -mm. It's gross, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> and then also was like, I'm also, I'm good with as little time with the children as, as possible. Yeah, the thing is, the joke is, I did hear a lot of like, oh, he was such a great dad. But then it was all, it's like, yeah, okay, and maybe... One of the Crane children can, you know, let me know otherwise. I mean, to be honest, I'd be freaked out if you contacted us. So it's best Please, not yeah, to. It's okay. <laughs> we're, we're fine. We don't. We we like to watch. We're voyeurs. We like to yeah, stay. We're, we're going to move on from this case and yep. not talk about it. So yep. Yep. we hope that you're in a better place now than you potentially were in your childhood. So. Bob and Ann's divorce was finalized June 17th, 1970, and just four months later, on October 16th, 1970, Bob and Patty got married. Patty's sister, Dale Russell, and her husband, Eric Braden, served as witnesses. Small world side note! The name Eric Braden may be familiar to some because he played Victor Newman on Young and the Restless for the last 42 years. Yes! Seriously, he was in 3,651 episodes, which is the second longest cast member after Doug Davidson, who played Paul Williams for 3,672 episodes. Did I go through a phase where I watched the show? Of course I did. I also went through phases where I was obsessed with General Hospital, Bold and the Beautiful, and Days of Our Lives, which that one I specifically watched in high school because of Jensen Ackles. Was this all a crazy ruse to bring up Supernatural? No, it was surprisingly organic. <laughs> I'm just fascinated when actors turn out to be related in some way, like Peggy Lipton, who some may know from The Mod Squad or Twin Peaks. She's the mother of Rashida Jones. Right. Uh, seriously, I could talk about things like this forever, but... I know we have a case to get to, so I'll just lastly point out that Patty's sister, Dale, has been married to Eric Braden since 1966. And that's impressive, so good on them. Nice. Back to our story. So Bob and Patty get married, but it isn't exactly the romantic affair that one might expect from a wedding. Since Bob was broke from his very, 
very recent divorce, they didn't have the money to get married. And since the couple were on a very successful TV show together and the production company wanted to try and capitalize on their relationship, the couple was married on a soundstage right next door to where Hogan's Heroes was filmed. Wow. According to Carol M. Ford, it was the first wedding to ever be performed on a soundstage. And while having the production company help with funds was great, it also meant that Bob and Patty had zero control over their own wedding. Patty said the first time she saw her bridal bouquet was when someone handed it to her right before she walked down the aisle. The production company controlled the guest list. Although they did allow for a few family friends and uh, to attend, some of their friends were left off the guest list to make room for the numerous gossip gossip columnists who were invited instead. Obviously, the show felt this would be a good promotional tool. It was the people's lives, but you know, either way. Yeah. And even though she was having an affair with a married man for years, I feel bad for Patty that her wedding wasn't her own, especially because they made her wear the blonde wig that she wore for the show. Patty was normally a brunette. But one story involving the wig that made me laugh the day after the wedding, the newlyweds board a flight to New York. Patty is without her signature wig because she's out in the world as Patty. She's not being Helga. She's just normally a brunette. Patty said, quote, when the flight took off, the stewardess came up and asked if she could speak to Bob privately in the back. He followed her and he came back laughing. I said, what was that all about? He said, they read that he would married the blonde girl from the show and they'd gotten him a little wedding cake to present to him, but they didn't know what to do because he's sitting with a brunette. <laughs> oh my God, that's so and funny. I find that amazing because it's like, well, just give me the cake. Is Do we think that maybe the reason Richard Dawson was his best man in that wedding was solely because the production company or the studio was it's puppeteering? Possible. It's possible. Because it's very obvious that they were like, oh my God. It's like if Ted Danson and Shelley Long were dating in real life. I mean, fans would have lost their minds to see a Cheers wedding. So, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Uh, eight months after the wedding on June 4th, 1971, the couple welcomed their son, Robert Scott Crane, which I find wild that he named not one but two sons Robert. Someone asked him why both of his sons are named Robert, to which Bob said, he likes the name. <laughs> Here we go. Despite having a new family, Bob did continue to financially support Anne until she remarried in June 1973. And to Anne, I say, God, I hope your second husband was good to you. Yeah, I hope so too. Bob also continued to financially support their children until the children became adults. So, I mean... If nothing else, there's that. It's not yep. everything, but it's something. No, I'll give him that. After Hogan's Heroes, Bob's career went, for lack of better words, stale. <laughs> he did a few episodes of Laugh-In, and then some single episodes of shows like Police Woman, The Doris Day Show, and Night Gallery. But Bob had hopes that the success of Hogan's Heroes would help him to launch a film career. In 1972, Bob was in a film called Patriotism, but it wasn't a box office film, but rather an educational film that gets cho shown to children at schools, like the kind of movie that Troy McClure would narrate if, it, if this was The Simpsons. <laughs> it was basically just Bob telling children that it was important to be patriotic. So not exactly the caliber of film that he was hoping for. Trying a for a film more his style, Bob tried to get cast... In The Godfather. One of the producers was the co-creator of Hogan's Heroes, and it was exactly the kind of dramatic work that Bob was looking for. But unfortunately, he had no dramatic experience, so no one even considered him, uh, and his connection to the producer didn't pay off. Bob felt very slighted to not be considered for the part. Then in 1973, Bob worked with a fresh-faced Kurt Russell in the live Disney film Super Dad. Unfortunately, it was not much of a hit, so Bob tried to make another go with television, and in 1975, he starred in The Bob Crane Show. However, the show failed miserably, 
and NBC canceled the series just two weeks after it began. Oh, woof. Yep. I think they continued to show the remaining, like, so many episodes, but yeah, that early on, that's, that's painful. Mm-hmm. And if that wasn't disappointing enough for Bob in December 1977, Patty handed him divorce papers. Bob was allegedly distraught about the split and was said to be greatly concerned about his son Robert. Where was his concern for his other three children when he was leaving their mother for his mistress? I don't know. <laughs> From what I've heard, he was a very devoted father, and I'm not going to pick apart his parenting. I have other things to pick apart. So work started to dry up, and Bob was distressed about the end of his marriage, so he needed a change of scenery. On January 28, 1978, Bob recorded an episode of a Canadian cooking show called Celebrity Cooks. Oh. His episode aired in Canada multiple times and was meant to air in the United States in July 1978. However, after Bob's death in June 1978, the choice was made to simply not air his episode in the United States at all. In February 1978, Bob signed on to host a reality show called The Hawaii Experience, where Bob would show the viewers behind the scenes at various resorts on the islands. Bob also managed to do single episodes of The Hardy Boys, Nancy Drew Mysteries, The Love Boat, and Quincy M.E. Shout out to Rachel Ray, because I know she loves Quincy. Loves Quincy. But these single guest appearances weren't enough to pay the bills, so money was tight. So Bob agreed to do dinner theater for the sake of a steady paycheck. Bob signed on to star in Beginner's Luck at the Windmill Dinner Theater in Scottsdale, Arizona. Weird synchronicity side note. The character of Paul Burnett that Bob played in Beginner's Luck was originally written for Monty Hall. Monty Hall passed on the project but suggested Bob as a better choice. Now Monty Hall was a Canadian born in Winnipeg Shout out, Winnipeg. Shout out to the peg. Yes. Center of Canada. I, I don't know if that's accurate, but that's something the dolls said? I think it is the center of Canada, yeah. Is it? Okay, yeah, great. I think, so. I, I think I just recall it from, I, I don't know if it was Limb Lifter or Age of Electric, but it was an interview with Terry David Mulligan. And I believe it was Ryan Dahl that some, I think Terry mentioned winnipeg and ryan doll just went center of canada <laughs> and i just took him at his word these are the things we remember folks <laughs> not richard karn hosted family feud but that's where we're at so monty hall born in winnipeg moved down to the u.s to work as a news reader and sportscaster monty hall's most notable work was as the host of the game show let's make a deal now follow along with me for a second. In 1953, while Bob was trying to break into larger radio markets, he heard about a potential opening. Radio host Gene Rayburn was set to leave his show and make the transition to television. Now Bob didn't have the experience or popularity at the time, so he was not considered as Gene's replacement, but he desperately wanted to be. Gene Rayburn went on to host Match Game from 1962 to 1969. Ten years later, in 1963, Bob was chosen over Regis Philbin for The Donna Reed Show. Regis would go on to host Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, among other things. So to sum up my weirdo synchronicity, which might just be me reaching, Bob Crane wanted to replace the host of Match Game during his radio days, went on to replace the host of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire on The Donna Reed Show, and the host of Let's Make a Deal in Beginner's Luck, and his Hogan's Hero co-star Richard Dawson went on to host Family Feud. It may be nothing, but being connected in some way to the hosts of four very popular game shows feels like a weird coincidence to me. And for those who think, wow, that was a waste of time, welcome to the inner workings of my brain. <laughs> this is the way I live. <laughs> <laughs> there she goes. Now, the moment... Dear listeners, the portion of the program that you've all been waiting for, although if I'm being honest, I always hope that people find my background info and tangents to be informative and delightful, but if they don't, that's fine. You just want murder? It's murder. On June 29th, 1978, at 2.10 p.m., 
Bob's girlfriend and beginner's luck co-star, he had a type, Victoria Barry Wells knocked on Bob's door at apartment 132A at the Winfield Apartments. Not only had he missed a lunch appointment, but he also missed Victoria's voiceover appointment. Bob had said he would help Victoria record a tape that he'd pass on to the producers of the show he was filming in Hawaii in the hopes they might consider her for an upcoming episode. Again, likes to date his co-stars and then likes to use his ins to try and help them, like try and bump them up. So I I don't know where I'm at. I, I'm... No, I'm building a profile. Oh, of course you are. I, I, I count on it. Yep. So Bob was a no-show for both appointments, which was very odd. So after calling and getting no answer, Victoria went to Bob's apartment. She knocked, but got no answer. So she tried the doorknob. It was unlocked. She entered the apartment and found a brutally beaten man laying in bed. There was blood spatter on the wall above the bed, on the ceiling, the pillow was soaked with blood. Officers later found blood on the back of the door, the doorknob, and on the curtain. Victoria left and called police. This is what we know about the crime scene. The front door was unlocked. There was no sign of forced entry, and there was no sign of a struggle. The victim was wearing a pair of white boxer shorts with a watch on his left wrist. The victim was lying on his right side with his hands tucked under the pillow, which made investigators believe that he was likely asleep when he was bludgeoned multiple times with an unknown object. After the victim was dead, the perpetrator wrapped an electrical cord around the victim's neck and tied it like a bow tie. Investigators checked with the building manager and found that the apartment was being leased to the windmill theater, so they contacted the theater's manager to come identify the body. The body was so badly beaten that manager Ed Beck said, quote, there was no way I could identify him from one side. So they had to roll the body over so Beck could officially say that the victim was Bob Crane. He was just 49 years old and only two weeks away from turning 50. Now, fair warning, dear listeners, if you decide to start Googling this case, you will come across crime scene photos and it is brutal. There is even a video on YouTube, I believe there's multiple, um, that the coroner took at the crime scene. So if that kind of visual is not your thing, I recommend you forego that Google, Google search. But if you don't mind the gore, then by all means. But you don't need my permission. I'm not your mother. But if you need a mother figure, then let me say, <laughs> avoid looking at those photos online. Eat your vegetables. And for the love of God, drink some water. <laughs> <laughs> Again, another planet. Mm -hmm. An autopsy was done on June 30th, 1978. It listed numerous contusions, including ones on the left lower lip, the left upper eyelid, and the left temple. There were also two parallel horizontal fractures to the skull behind the left ear. The fractures measured about four inches by two and a half inches. And something I'm going to only touch on briefly in a 2002 movie about Bob Crane's life called Autofocus, it is suggested that Bob had a penile implant so that he'd look better in amateur videos, which we will get into momentarily. And I can say that after thoroughly reading the autopsy report, that was not true. His junk was real. That wasn't in my notes. Thank you for, thank you for... Thank you for doing God's work, is what I want to say. <laughs> uh, that part wasn't in the notes, but uh, what I like to I trim think your wings, just fly. <laughs> <laughs> what I like is it's. I, I feel like we have a new slogan coming, which is like Chrissy Oxborough confirming the status of junk since 2019, 2020, 2020. Well, oh boy, 2020. I mean we. We started in 2020. That's what I, I don't meant. know how much junk investigation I've done. <laughs> I've done. Okay, I okay, I got a new one then. Christy Oxborough, podcaster, <laughs> investigative reporter, junk analyst. <laughs> I I guess you could also just say Blanche. That's basically the same thing. But you're right. But you're right. You're right. You're right. I do like that. 
Um, and while we're speaking about that movie, shout out to Greg Kinnear. He plays Bob Crane in the movie, and I love Greg Kinnear. He's charming. Yeah. Uh, two things in the autopsy that I would like to mention is there was minimal aspiration of blood in the lungs, which means he died almost instantly. Hmm. Which I guess, I mean, thankful for him. The second is that it was listed as, quote, flaky white dry material in pubic hair, right lower abdomen, right anterior thigh. Some have suggested that a man ejaculated onto Bob before or after his death, but since that sort of testing wasn't around in 1978, no specimen was collected, so we'll never know. But if it was semen, why are we all just assuming it was another man? It could have been the man who died or why are we assuming it's semen at all maybe he had sex before he died and the substance was from a woman we don't know these things but yeah again it was not collected so it can never be tested and we will just never know the cause of death was listed as blunt force trauma so let's talk about the investigation which is frustrating at best and isn't that always the way? It's not even a spoiler at this point anymore. If the investigation was bumbled, most likely it'll end up on this show. <laughs> According to investigators, Bob was last seen on June 29th, 1978 at 1 a.m. I could not find who the last person was to see him alive. Time of death was estimated to be around 4 a.m. Bob's body was found at 2.10 p.m. After the police arrived, the coroner, Dr. Heinz K., known affectionately as just Dr. K., because his last name is incredibly difficult to say, and I wasn't even going to put myself through it. Mm -hmm. uh, he arrived on scene at 4 p.m. when he took video of the body and the scene. In the video, Dr. K. can be seen using a straight razor to shave a portion of Bob's head so he could get a better look at the wound. And to that, I'd like to quote Amy Poehler and Seth Meyers and say, Really? Really? I understand the concept of shaving a body to see a wound more clearly, but at the crime scene, where you could potentially contaminate wounds and the scene, yeah. I didn't even go to medical school, and I know these things. And just to be clear... The doctor who was at the crime scene was not the same doctor who performed the autopsy. So I want to believe the autopsy was done properly. But then again, no sample was taken of the white flaky substance found on Bob's body. Well, what's interesting about that, too, and yeah. I understand that, that it was a different time, but it could have been anything. I mean, it could have been... It could have been paint. It could have been caulking. It could have been, I don't pardon the pun, it could have been, but you know what I mean? Like, it's like, it could have been things that weren't human is my other point. Like, maybe it could have been a clue. It could have been glue. Like, it could have been a clue for something else is my point. So it's, it is it is interesting to me that they didn't even, it wasn't protocol yeah. to at least collect it. That's, that's interesting. Oh, well, an investigator later claims that he asked Dr. Thomas Jarvis, the medical examiner who did the autopsy, to collect a sample of the white substance and Jarvis allegedly responded with quote what's that gonna tell you that he had a piece of ass before he was killed and you think so, this yeah. man did a good autopsy <laughs> uh I wrote that note before I found that part so uh got it, got I it. guess I just don't like any of the doctors in this case uh the crime scene itself was contaminated and it was never properly sealed Numerous people were brought to the apartment, including Bob's oldest son, Robert, Bob's business manager, Lloyd Vaughn, and an attorney named Bill Goldstein. Investigators actually let these men wander the crime scene, touching things, looking at things, all of that. I know that I don't have any crime scene training, but I feel like letting random people into a scene is not the move. I also feel as child if you're like oh yeah by the way your your parent is was brutally beaten and the blood is everywhere i don't want to see that room yeah how like old, I, how old was his oldest at that point 
Oh, at that point, this was 1978. When did I say he was born? No, 60. There's a note there somewhere. There's, I mean, he, I, I think he was in his 20s by this point. Yeah. Oh, 1950. Uh, he was born 51. We got there at the same time. Yep. And this was 68, so he was 17. This was 78. So it's sorry. okay. You're doing great. God damn it. I'm not even drunk. Um, okay, so he was an adult man, but still, that does feel very questionable. Like, that's an upsetting thing for any family member to have to view. And yeah. Also, uh, yeah. by the 70s, we're not talking... This wasn't the 1870s. Like, by the 70s, they knew to rope off a crime scene. Give me a break. Yeah. I also, like... I mean, if he wanted to go, I guess... I don't know if the body was there while he was there. Um, I hope not, because I know the woman who found the body, um, she has had intense therapy since finding the body uh, to the point where an author whose biography I read about this, um, she interviewed the woman. She took her to that apartment like in like 2010 or something like that. And had her touch the doorknob. And that was as far as the woman could go. She said she closed that door years ago and she can't open it again. Wow. And it, I just, I, I mean, I don't know if it's kudos or not about taking her there. I would not have, but no. maybe I'm weak. I don't know. Oh, I know no. I am. But that's neither here nor there. No, not true. So, while investigating the scene, police found video equipment, cameras, a makeshift photo lab, and dozens of videos of Bob having sex with numerous women. Bob always had an enthusiasm for new technology. The ground floor of the home he shared with his wife Patty was home to Bob's mass collection of audio and video equipment. In 1971, he bought one of the first video cameras. He filmed family vacations, daily life with his kids, and even behind-the-scenes moments on Hogan's Heroes. When he bought a tape recorder, he would take it everywhere he went. He once said in an interview he felt lost without it. When he lived apart from his family, he would send home tape-recorded messages as opposed to handwritten letters. It is said that Bob took the recorder with him everywhere and that he even kept a second one in his dressing room during his time on TV. The problem became when Bob's love of technology combined with his sex addiction. Many claim that his addiction started when he got to Hollywood, but it appears to have started long before that. Bob's parents were very strict Catholics, so some have suggested that Bob's wild sexual activities were equivalent to, like, a minister's child acting out. Now, I need it to be clear that I in no way judge Bob Crane for his extracurricular activities. As long as everyone involved consented and was of age, go for it. If no one gets hurt, it's not our business as to what happened behind those closed doors. My issue is how much he cheated on his wives. Although Bob claimed when he mar married Patty, it was understood that he was, quote, free to pursue his interests in extramarital sex and amateur pornography as long as he returned home to her. Many have said that Bob's wandering eye started back in the early 1950s when he was working at WICC Radio. By then, he was well known for having affairs with multiple women. It was when he got to Hollywood that this his interest in filming and, photo and photogra photographing women began. Found in his home, were hundreds of Polaroids of naked women and Bob having sex with different women. His family claims the women in the photos and videos found always consented to being on camera, although some of the women have since then claimed they didn't know they were being filmed at all. The family points out that if cameras were not hidden, they were out in the open, but they might not necessarily have known the camera was turned on. Or they might not have considered it. Or I don't know. But And are we certain that there weren't more cameras hidden? Like, if he was on, on top of the, the latest technology all the time. That is a good point. 
Some say that Bob's obsession with amateur pornography had to do with his constant need for love and attention because he never truly got over his years of fame. His oldest son, Bobby Jr., believed that Bob turned, the video, turned to videos and photos because he was, quote, overcompensating for the lack of a solid career in the final years, and maybe that fed his ego to meet a woman in a nightclub and they'd go off and sleep together. But I never looked at it as dark because it was consensual. Again, I, the family is like, it was always consensual and I need to believe that. But at the same time, it's like, I don't know, mm. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, Bobby Jr. looks back fondly at the time when his father took him to the 1972 premiere of the movie Deep Throat when he was 21. He took his son to that. He did. He uh -huh. did. He took him to the premiere because he got to meet some of the stars and he was tickled that the stars were all around. And by he, I mean Bob. The son was just like, okay, cool. Uh, but when it came out that Bob had a massive collection of photos and videos of naked women, investigators started to wonder if it was possible that he was murdered by one of the women's significant others or an angry family member. And while that's possible, we don't know the names of any of the women involved, so I can't exactly look into the people in their lives. But who can I look into? Well, what about the two suspects in the case? On the night before Bob's death, he was seen having dinner with his friend, John Henry Carpenter. Not the same John Carpenter as the famous Hollywood John Carpenter. Got it. Bob's son, Bobby Jr., claims that two days before Bob's death, he called his son to say that he was two weeks away from 50 and was ready to make some changes in his life. And from what I can tell, Bob even looked into professional counseling for his sex addiction in the months leading up to his death. His son also said he was divorcing Patty and that he wanted to cut John Carpenter out of his life because he was ready for a clean slate. Bobby claims that witnesses came forward to say that Bob and John had a heated argument the night of his death. Oh, boy. So those witnesses exist and do those witnesses exist? And what exactly did they see? I don't know, but I'm not surprised that Bob's son wants to put the blame on John Carpenter. John was a home video salesman from Los Angeles who met Bob Crane on the set of Hogan's Heroes. He was apparently some sort of associate of someone who knew Richard Dawson. John introduced Bob to home video technology. He would often meet up with Bob when he was on the road, where they'd pick up women and film their encounters with the women. It was suggested that John liked the, quote, hangers-on, as he wouldn't normally have a chance with them without Bob. Mm. In June 1978, John came to visit, but this time Bob looked him, booked him a room at a nearby hotel when normally he would have stayed with Bob. Was this a sign that Bob was really trying to distance himself, as his son has suggested? The sketchy thing about John is that on the morning of Bob's murder, John flew back to L.A. Bob was supposed to drive him to the airport. It was even written in Bob's planner, which was open on the bedside table, an entry that simply said, John leaves 10 a.m. Bob also let out, left out some items to give to John, such as a pair of swim trunks that was found at the scene. John said that when Bob didn't show up, he just took a cab to the airport. And I want to know, how long did you wait? Because that would have taken some time to get a cab to show up and then take the cab to the airport. I have a lot of questions. Yeah. Uh, and when he arrived home, John called around looking for Bob. He called Bob's apartment multiple times, the windmill theater, and even Bob's oldest son. A few days after the crime, police looked into the rental car that John had while he was in Arizona. Inside the car, they found seven blood stains inside what? the Chrysler Cordoba, all on the passenger side. John says that he has no idea how the blood got there. The car was immediately impounded and processed. Unfortunately, DNA testing was not available in 1978, so the best the lab techs could do was blood typing. With the blood that was tested, it was found to be type B, 
positive, which according to the San Diego Blood Bank is normally found in 9% of Americans. Fun fact about blood types, apparently the least common is AB negative with just like 1% of Americans and the highest is O positive at 38%. It also happened that B positive was the same blood type as Bob Crane. I don't know what t blood type John Carpenter was, but according to the police, nobody else who handled that car had the same blood type as Bob Crane. Police believe the fact that there was no forced entry, that it was likely that Bob knew his killer, and the fact combined with the witnesses claiming to see the two men fighting that same night, the police were convinced that John was the killer, especially now that they had this blood evidence. Unfortunately, police were unable to arrest John as they didn't have any concrete evidence. But could John really murder the man he described as, quote, my best friend, what, one of my best friends? Which was a moment in a police interview that I found interesting. It's like John realized in that split second, if he said best friend, oh, he should probably distance himself. So he quickly added one of my best friends because yeah. it was literally my best friend, one of my best friends. And it's like, why would you quickly make that distinction if you weren't trying to make it seem like you weren't as close as you yeah. were? Uh, according to police, uh, they never gave up trying to prove that John was the killer. The blood from John's rental car was tested four times in the late 90s and early er, late 80s and early 90s but the tests came up inconclusive then in 1990 county attorney rick romley decided to reopen the case investigators re-interviewed re everyone involved and once again believed that all roads led to john during the new investigation while looking over crime scene photos they noticed a blood stain in the shape of a v on the bed sheets with, when that stain was compared with numerous objects, it was found to match a camera tripod. And when they looked at previous photos from Bob's apartment, they saw a camera and its tripod in the photos. Neither the camera nor the tripod were found at the crime scene. So 12 years after Bob's murder, police had finally established the murder weapon. It was a camera tripod. And also, before I forget, the uh, co electrical cord that was wrapped around his neck had been like the cord from a lamp or something that had been cut and then used to tie around his neck and was, again, done so. After his death, I have a lot of questions. Yeah. So then police come up with the theory that John beat Bob to death with the tripod and then tossed the tripod in the passenger seat of his rental car causing blood to spatter around and the seven blood stains. But John was adamant that he was innocent. And police still didn't have any physical evidence to tie John to the crime. So investigators went back over all of the case photos. Uh, when one investigator noticed something strange in one of the pictures of John's rental car. In a photo of the inside panel of the passenger side door, there was a red round substance. A pathologist examined the photo and determined that the substance was likely tissue from Bob Crane's skull. <gasps> now, because a lot of the investigators in the original case were straight up incompetent, the actual substance was either never collected or simply lost over the years. So we have no way of knowing exactly what that substance was. But it was enough for the police to get a warrant. And in the fall of 1992, John Henry Carpenter was arrested while on his way to work and charged with the first degree murder of Bob Crane. When the family finally, w when the case, family, wow, don't know where that came from. When the case finally went to trial, John's lawyers focused on Bob's amateur pornography and pushed the idea that the murderer was probably one of the photographed women or someone related to one of the women. And once again, the blood testing came up inconclusive and due to a lack of DNA, John was acquitted in October 1994. And then John Carpenter died from a heart attack on September 4th, 1998, at the age of 70. So did John get away with murder or not? Now that he's dead, we will never know for sure. I just can't believe 
that blood was found in his rental car. And he said, oh, wow, yeah, I don't know how it got there. And police were like, oh, shucks, okay, bye. I know that I'm not familiar with, you know, law. But that feels wild to me. And I'm not saying there's blood in his car. Oh, my God, arrest him. But just it feels like nothing could be done. Um, but for the sake of being thorough, if John wasn't the murderer, who else could it have been? Well, according to Bob's oldest son, quote, For me, it was always one of two people, either John or my stepmother. And that, dear listeners, brings us to Patty Olson. Ooh. So as I mentioned earlier, Patty, who went by the stage name Sigrid Valdis, married Bob in 1970 after having an affair with him for multiple years. It turns out that before Bob, Patty married an entrepreneur named George Gilbert Atea on November 5th, 1958. Patty was 23 at the time. The couple had a daughter named Melissa, and in 1964, Patty filed for legal separation. But the couple never legally divorced and ended up living in the same house until George's death in November 1967, at the age of 46. Now, I have looked high and low, but I cannot find George's cause of death anywhere. But a man dying at 46 seems suspicious to me. Granted, I don't know the man's lifestyle or medical history, so it could be completely reasonable. It just raises red flags for me, especially when you Google him and there's just like nothing about him. Hmm. So I have a lot of questions. So Patty's husband dies in 1967 and in 1970 she marries Bob Crane. In 1971 she gave birth to Bob's fourth child and her second child, a boy named Robert Scott. And at some point in their marriage, they adopted a teenager named Anna Marie. Apparently, Anna was a 17-year-old from Mexico who worked at the Crane House as a housekeeper. And for some reason, they decided to legally adopt her. But uh -huh. I don't think it was as their child. Like, she continued to work for them after they adopted her. And from what I've read, adopting teenagers who emigrated from Mexico and worked as servants was just the thing to do in California in the early 70s. Oh, God. Yeah. I have a lot of thoughts on that, but we don't have the time for yeah. that tangent. So, you know. Yeah. So if Patty was in the middle of divorcing the man who openly cheated on her time and time again, then why would she kill him? Well, according to Bob's son, quote, if there if there's no divorce, she keeps what she gets. And if there's no husband, she gets the whole thing. And let's face it, money is a pretty big motive. Do I think that Patty personally picked up the camera tripod and beat her husband to death? No, I don't. But that doesn't mean that she didn't have someone do it for her. But at the time of Bob's death, he was practically bankrupt. So money might not have been motive after all. However, shortly after Bob's death, NBC struck a new syndication deal for Hogan's Heroes, and since Bob owned a small piece of it, his estate would inherit millions. And since the divorce was not finalized at the time of his death, Patty was still legally his wife, which meant she was his sole heir. Mm. So was she involved and she lucked out with this windfall syndication? Or did she hear about the syndication in advance and had to act fast before her motive was revealed? Or was she just another victim in this story, losing the man she loved to a tragic murder? Patty, unfortunately, died of lung cancer October 14th, 2007, at the age of 72. Now, just prior to her own death, Patty had Bob's remains exhumed from his plot in Los Angeles and moved 
to a new plot in Westwood Cemetery so that when she died, they could be buried together. And because she was still legally Bob's wife at the time of his death, Patty was totally within her right to move Bob's remains, even without the consent of Bob's first family. Mm. And maybe she saw Bob as the love of her life. I don't know. The man openly cheated on her for their entire relationship, but that doesn't mean she doesn't love him. Uh, I just feel that if I'm divorcing someone and they die before our divorce is final, I'm probably not going to go out of my way to be buried next to them. Unless she was trying to make it look like she was trying to keep the ruse going. That it was like, that's how much I loved him, see? Oh, that is possible. I also wondered if it was something as much as like, she, from what I can understand, basically like gave up acting to like take care of her son. So was it like a, you know that fans are gonna go hunt down his gravestone. Fans probably aren't gonna go look for the girl who played Helga for five of six seasons. But it's like, is that a draw for people to be like, oh, look. They're buried together. Like, was it some sort of, like, people are going to come visit me because they're going to seek him out, whereas they wouldn't seek her out? I don't know. It's, I, I, again, I have a lot of questions. And, yeah, you know. So after Bob's remains were moved, Patty and her son Robert Scott allegedly set up a memorial website for Bob. And when, the, uh, on this website, they tried to sell some of Bob's amateur films. Oh my god. Which feels, I don't know, gross? Uh, the site was shut down and the son later said that he regretted his actions and since then uh, he has destroyed all of his father's Polaroids and films and is pushing to get Bob Crane inducted into the Radio Hall of Fame. So... Okay. I mean, psychologist hat guilt <laughs> over, you know, selling your dad's homemade porns, which is gross. But also doing it with his mother is a layer. A hundred percent. I mean, I, I'm only seeing it from like your dad's porns. Like, no, you take those things and you either bury them deep or you burn them. But what about the women in these videos? Like, how many of these did you sell? How many of those women are out there in a random old man's house? Like, there's a Nicolas Cage movie about finding, like, a porn, although I think it's specifically, like, a snuff film in some guy's stuff, isn't it? Uh, Was that 8mm? Oh, yes, I think so. Where, like, yeah. the guy dies and his wife is like, I found this in his stuff and it's like a video of this girl and she's like, I need to know if it's real and he has to investigate it. And I saw it once and I was horrified and swore I'd never go back. Yeah, that's, so, that's fair. I'm not suggesting that's what these films were of. Of course. Bob's. But even if it was, as far as I know, sex between two consenting adults. First of all, uh, I mean, Bob probably doesn't care either way. But the woman involved, stop it. Also, think about the steps that would have had to have been taken. Bob died in the 70s. There was no digitization back then. In order to get these on the internet, they would have had to take these films and have them digitized and uploaded to the internet. Like, it took steps to do it. It's not like, oh, I oh. found porn on his phone that he made, and then I boop, boop, in a moment of not thinking straight i did this thing mm -hmm. and it was a poor decision like there was there was lead time that would have had to have been spent on this project again a project that he was tackling alongside his mother I... yeah mm -hmm. uh, yeah the idea that they may have ever watched them even even just a piece of them oh, is God. is a lot but it's I starting mean, to feel like now granted i i won't dwell on this now because we'll get to me in a minute i know but like i i i, I mean the motive is thick with her there's a lot there yeah 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 i mean is it is possible 
they said uh, that they were selling his films there. It's possible that it was like, I'll send you a reel. And like they got like an old timey reel. Oh, I see. I see. Or whatever. I mean, that's possible. But the idea of digitizing is next level. But I love that I ass- I love that I assumed that they were starting their own miniature like porn hub where it was a subscription based service and you could click on <laughs> Bob Crane porn and then watch, you know, b- just based on what, you know, tier that you're you're at, what you could access to. That's where my yeah. brain rent went. But you're right. You're right. What what you're I right. like is your familiarity with Pornhub. I, I I don't. Uh, that that is not my suggestion. No. Um, no. But I thank no. you for thanking me. And I get I get now. Wow, I really took I took two large leaps. But you know what? I'll still yeah. say this. I think the amount of time it takes to like make a make a website, uh, catalog the film reels, upload you know descriptions of the film reels. Like it feels like again, it wasn't just a uh, in the heat of the moment a bad decision was made. It feels like there was just a lot of premeditation to that crime (laughs) yeah and the idea of like oh god we need to make more money off this man yeah when you you got everything yeah like i just but that's to me again i'm uh, i'm building my profile you're building a case i know so before we get to the end of our story We have to touch on the most recent investigation into Bob Crane's murder. In November 2016, Fox News reporter John Hook reunited the investigators from the 1990 investigation, and they went through the 11 boxes of evidence that remained at the Maricopa County Attorney's Office. Now, I don't think I wrote this down somewhere uh, because I lost it when I was finishing my notes, but there was this this reporter, John Hook. I can't. But he he made like he wrote a book, but he's made a series of YouTube videos, which I went through all of them to see what it was. And it was a very like and we're going to tell you in the next one. Like, you know, it was like, oh, come on. And then it finally gets to the final one. And I'm like, the final one's like 40 seconds. He doesn't have time to say anything. No, it's because they still didn't tell you anything. You had to wait for the live segment. Uh, And I was just, I was just very annoyed. But one of his comments was like, here's, we're going to, we're going to zoom in on this important document that was from like 2002. That was like, John Carpenter is dead. So you know what? The investigation's over. All of this evidence and all of these files should all be destroyed. And in the video, he specifically was like, they were ordered to be destroyed. Well, we're lucky that they weren't. But I took a screenshot of the the letter that he was like, oh, look at this. And the screenshot clearly says it is recommended that the files be destroyed. So clearly someone, some lazy employee was like, recommend it? Ah, cool. And was like, doesn't mean I have to do it. And so they let it go. They didn't order them to. They just were like, you can. You're allowed. If you want. Get right. rid of it. Right. But it was just, it's like, dude, don't put, don't show the paper if I can prove that you were lying. Yeah. Anyhow. So the main focus of this new investigation was to retest the blood samples that were found in John Carpenter's rental car that now DNA testing has come so much further so maybe they can get something better out of it. The results came back with two contributors. One was too degraded, so it was considered inconclusive, but the other was identified as an unknown male. This means that the blood found in John Carpenter's car was not Bob Crane's blood. It also was not John Carpenter's blood. Now, my big complaint about this whole investigation is the reporter, who has since written a book about this, did several taped segments on the news and then chose to do the DNA results live on the show with Bob Crane's oldest son and some of the original investigators sitting live in the studio with him. I get he's looking for ratings. I get it. But when he gave the results, it was like the DNA found on the door of John Carpenter's rental car is not from Bob Crane. And I was just like, 
okay, Maury Povich, calm down. Like, it was so not the father. Yeah. I couldn't handle it. And I just felt like that was not the move to make. But does this mean that John Carpenter was innocent? I want to say yes, but honestly, even though it was a rental and that blood could have come from anywhere, it's still highly suspicious that his rental car just happened to have blood in it the very day his close friend was brutally murdered. So I don't buy that the blood was already in the car when he rented it. But whose blood is it if it's not Bob's? Because it's not Bob's and it's not John's. So who the hell's blood is it? If that, if a pathologist said that little speck was likely like brain tissue or something, who, whose was it? <laughs> you know, who else was in that car? And are there people, other people who want, wanted Bob dead? Investigators said they didn't interview a single woman who disliked Bob or was mad at him for finding out about the videos or the photos. That doesn't mean the killer wasn't the spouse or boyfriend or even family member of one of these women. But again, since we don't know what women were involved, and honestly, I'm glad that we don't, because it's not our damn business, we have no further leads. In 2019, there was a plan to reboot Hogan's Heroes, focusing on the descendants of the original characters, but as of January 2022, that appears to have gone nowhere. It could pop up at some point. I don't know. Maybe they were like, oh, shit, there's Nazis in real life still? No, nah, okay, let's not put them in a sitcom. I don't know. Bob Crane was described as charismatic, fun-loving, affable, incredibly kind, and a tremendous natural talent. Friends and colleagues said that he had a wonderful sense of comedy and magnetism that drew people in. One friend said, quote, Bob had a way about him that could brighten the darkest day. He made others feel good about themselves with a generosity of spirit rare in anyone. And yet, whenever Bob Crane's name is brought up, no one mentions any of the beautiful things that people say about him. Instead, any positivity that he managed to create gets replaced with whispers about his sordid lifestyle. And whether or not you agree with the choices that he made, Bob Crane was brutally murdered and his killer got away with it and no one deserves that. Reporting for True Crime and Cocktails, I'm a shell. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, oh. I have so many thoughts. Yeah. I am buzzing. Uh, but let's take one more quick break, grab another drink, hit the can one more time, and I'm going to tell you my thoughts after this on this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. All right, last clap. On three, one, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. Of course, we are talking about the very mysterious murder of Bob Crane. And we're about to get into my... I'm, I'm Again, I have to stop calling them chaotic notes because now they're very... They're not chaotic. They're very they're linear. Not. They're taken in order. They're easy to follow. Um, we're going to get into my notes and thoughts that's what i should be calling them just my notes and thoughts yes All right. put a positive spin on a positive thing thank you kindly um all right first thing his car broke down on the way to new york this was in the 50s yeah and a horse and wagon took him the rest of the way yeah a horse and wagon sorry it may have been late 40s or early 50s but point 50s, being yeah I didn't realize that people were still utilizing horses and wagons as a means of transportation at that point. I assume since it was a farmer that it was potentially like he was in the middle of nowhere and the farmer was out and about or whatever and was just like, well, this is the vehicle we're in. Get in. Yeah. Interesting. Um, <laughs> again, watch Hogan's Heroes. Uh <laughs> All right, a couple of things that just struck me as I had a feeling that there may be details that would become relevant to him. And I agree with you that, like, his sexual proclivities are not really anyone's business, and, and I agree with that. But I think just kind of, like, creating a kind of idea of potentially what his mindset was could be helpful because I, did he get himself 
you know, what was his, his mindset at the time of his death, those kinds of things. Hello, Peaches. You've come here to come here. I don't know if people could hear it on the recording, but Sharky would not leave me alone for most of that last bit of the show. He was purring so loud, and he kept hitting my hands, hitting the mic. Anyway, and now, now Peaches has joined me. So is, she, it's uh, a f- is she wearing a tiny vest? Of course. Of course she is. She's wearing a tiny fleece vest. <laughs> oh, my God. Because they zip up on the back. It's easier to get her to put them on. Of course. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> anyway. Yep. Um, but yes, I, I do think it is of, of note and, and just roll with me on this because there's some things that came up that I thought was interesting. He collected clippings of all of his press from Hogan's Heroes and kept notes on the ratings for each episode of the show. I'm like, that is interesting because when I was starting out as an actor in Canada, you kind of have to keep as much press as you can to, to file for your green card because you need to prove if you want to work in the States that it's like that you're very established in this profession right so I did that for years but I'll tell you a little something then once I got my green card and I got a gig down here I stopped (laughs) now there are some pieces of press that I have kept like if I'm in People Magazine that's a thrill for me so I have bought you know the odd People Magazine I've been in stuff like that but to me it's like that's just like automatically I'm like it's starting to paint a picture that this is somebody who is putting a lot of kind of uh it's just interesting again because he didn't have a struggle as an actor and then now it's like well now I'm in the big time and I really like you know and and also you know which I'll get to in a in a second um well I'll jump ahead for a second then also naming his son his both of his sons the same name saying I just like the name like it's like I'm just getting like a like a like an arrogance at this point in his life yep which does not mean anything, and I'm certainly not implying that it does, he deserved to be murdered of whatsoever. Not. But I'm just, again, what, what kind of human are we talking about here? And then that made me think of George Foreman. Did you know that George Foreman has 12 children and that uh, he, his five sons are all named George Jr.? That's right. what that made me think of. Right. Yeah. And then he said, he said, I named all my sons George Edward Foreman so they would always have something in common. I was like, well, yeah, Whoops. but that's also extremely confusing. But and also, they also have the same dad. There could be that being brothers, S- being they have that siblings. In anyway, I just thought that was very interesting. Again, like in building up who this person is. So then, when you start to get into like what sounds to me like a fairly large amount of pornography, and the fact that his specific thing was wanting it on film wanting to almost have those trophies for lack of a better term of his experiences like wanting proof like just like with the show it was like he kept all the press and he kept all the ratings and then he kept all the photos and all the tapes of all the women like it, it's it's again this is just building a very interesting profile of of what this guy's mindset kind of was and and I don't know what I make of that yet but I bring it up because I think again we're we're building profiles which is all I ever want to do of course um, oh people thought he was just like his character and not acting that sounds like it must be a terrible thing to experience her name is Dina um <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding uh. no, seriously I am a good actor uh anyway um yes so the next thing uh was you talking about the Young and the Restless actors and how they had done 3,000 episodes of a show that's a great example of they did 3,000 episodes, and they're still doing that show. And Bob, after 62, was like, I'm bored. I want to do something else. Like, again, it just it, – it, again, it's creating – I'm getting a feel for this guy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's interesting to me. Um, Night Gallery, you mentioned, he guest starred on. Now, this was wild because you mentioned earlier Mary Poppins and, like, hey, you want to step into this painting and whatever. There is yeah. an episode of the Night Gallery where there's a man who goes to a painting, an art gallery – and he sees a painting of a man in a boat. It's very peaceful. And he's able yeah. to, like, astral project himself into the painting. And he does this all the time. And then he decides he wants to do it. He wants to just be there in the painting forever. Oh, boy. And he goes to, like, I don't know. I don't remember it vividly. But he goes to put himself in the painting or jump in the painting. Yeah. But something happens with a mirror in the room or something. And he reflects into the wrong painting. And then the last shot is this very graphic, very scary picture of like uh, Christ on the cross. It's all red and black. And and you just hear a sound of him like 
like wh- like whimpering in agony that he's now damned himself to staying in that painting. So I just thought it was wild that you brought up that oh. Night Gallery was brought up and that Mary Poppins phenomenon. So then very quickly on the break, I was like, I have to find out, was it Bob Crane in that episode of Night Gallery? Because that would be wild, that that was the one episode that I remember so vividly. Right. Um, it was not. Ah, oh, that would have like been to great. Read you, well, wait for it, because I'd like to read you the synopsis of the episode of Night Gallery he did. An adulterer takes his wife to a house that is haunted to get rid of her. That's right, a cheating husband tries to engage the services of a ghost to try and kill his wife. I just feel like, considering Bob was so known for cheating, it feels odd to me. Like, it feels like, was it a joke that they cast him in that part? Like, were all the cigarette-smoking white men executives like, ha, 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 this is hilarious. <laughs> Bob loves cheating. Um, <laughs> or, Thank you, for you know that. what I mean? Like, energetically i'm just saying i think that's wild um we brought up again building the profile about him this idea that he really liked having affairs and relationships with his co-stars and then trying to help them get gigs and this to me is very interesting because he was always arguably in the position of power he was always higher on the call sheet than them he was the lead etc so by today's standards, if you were trying to make a move on one of the recurring actors on your show as the lead, that could be construed quite poorly. Um, and certainly also then doing like being like, hey, you know, I'll, I'll help you get another gig on something else. Like one could say, again, through 2022 standards, if we if we talked about this in a different light, it would be. Oh yeah, he kept he kept sleeping with his co-stars and giving them the promise that he'd help them get more work. It's again, um, I'm not yeah. saying that that's the case, but I'm just saying that when that's you know, it it it, it again nowadays that kind of stuff is very dicey. Um, but again, to me, it speaks to wanting to feel important, wanting to feel like maybe kind of like a savior complex. I don't know, wanting to feel all of these kinds of things. Um, which is again very interesting because does that then become an extension of himself if he helps one of those actresses get a bigger gig like does that give him again like he likes to collect all these photos and clippings and all of the above again just things to think about Um, it's interesting to me it's interesting to me The blood is interesting to me because it is speculative, right? Like, that is not a smoking gun in that, as we know, it turned out it was not his blood. So, Right. um, And, listen, rental cars, who knows? It could have been from anybody. It's interesting to me also, though, how sad that that blood never got properly investigated as the the brain tissue or or skull Mm -hmm. tissue or whatever. Um, That's troubling. Um, But that also makes me ask... Now, I understand that the blood stain you said it was in the shape of the V in the crime scene photos and that they deduced that that means it's a camera tripod. There was not one found in the room. Yes. But then I'm also assuming they never found one of John. Now, granted, I understand John could have gotten rid of it. But I guess I also feel like that is also kind of speculative, right? Like, yes, okay, granted, it, it looks like it fits the shape, whatever. Yeah. And it could very well be that. But because we don't have the tripod with any DNA on it of Bob's, and I mean, we wouldn't have had DNA back there anyway. Again, like, it's just, it's it's so confounding because that's still, again, that's not like, that's not a sure thing to me. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Um, again, by today's standards. Now, the, the other thing, two things, uh, and then I'm almost done. I just can't, I also, like, what was the fight? I would love to know, what was the fight that he and John had the night before? Because I can't really see what the motive would have been. Unless it was something about, you know, Bob wants to change his ways. You said he was trying to get into counseling. He, he was trying to, you know, get out, get some help and stuff like that. And that was cramping John's style. Okay, I guess that's something. But is it enough to kill? I don't know. Um, unless it was, is there someone that, John wanted to sleep with and Bob cock blocked him or something 
again, okay, I guess that's a motive. But it's just hard for me to find what a motive would be when they were so close for so long and they were yeah. also doing very intimate things together. Like two dudes going out regularly and picking up women and videotaping themselves having sex with them. I don't know if they were in the same room or not. Regardless, like that's a that's a close friendship. That's male so bonding. To, it's very close. Yeah. So to go from that to then a brutal murder, because that's the other thing too. The fact that he died almost instantly from that blunt force trauma, yeah. that's a lot of rage. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some have speculated the movie um, autofocus was like, tried to make you feel like John was maybe bisexual and was in love with Bob okay. and like tried to make a move and it didn't work out. Um, I don't know. Uh, no, one, no one who knew John has been like, oh, maybe. Uh, my thing, the only thing that made me go, oh, I could see it, would be this dude who's not the handsomest dude is finally getting all these girls, who knows, like probably younger women than he could ever dream because they want to be as close to Bob Crane as possible because Bob Crane uh, wasn't attractive, maybe. Sure. He was classically handsome. There it is. Uh, Blanche would, like, give herself, like, two water bottle <laughs> squirts to the face, at least. The point is, <laughs> I'm meaning Blanche Devereaux, specifically, not Blanche, Blanche Oxborough. Um, but uh, I just wonder, like, he was used to that lifestyle. He loved going out to party, loved going out to pick up these women. And what if at one point it was like, Bob's like, it's going to stop. I'm done. I'm done. You hanging around me and using me for my celebrity or whatever. And then all of a sudden this lifestyle he was used to and getting like videotaping all these women. Now he has to go pick up women alone. I mean, yeah, I, I bet he was me, less successful on his own. If it was a, then if in the heat of the moment they got into a fist fight and he accidentally killed him, I buy it. But this sure. is like premeditated. We're sneaking in in the night and I'm brutally murdering you. I don't know. I mean, I, again, I don't know. I don't know. Again, I don't know John and I don't know. <laughs> to your point, totally fair. Maybe that was that big to him. I don't know. But it just, again, there's a lot of question marks. I also thought it was interesting. John leaves at 10 a.m. was in his planner. But then it was also implied that it was like John was waiting for Bob to go to the airport, right? Yeah. So like he was expecting Bob to pick him up and go to the airport. Bob was supposed John, Bob was supposed to drive John to the airport, but John had a rental car. I assume the rental car had to go back, but didn't go to the airport somehow. I don't know. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. That seems odd to me. But again, who knows? Um, also, do we know who? Do we know that Bob wrote that in his is in his journal? Was we do the not. handwriting ever tested? Right. It's true. It's also something. Um, and then the last thing I just had to say, you know, in terms of motive, Patty has all the motive in the world. Because let's say for a second, I mean, if she gave up her career, yeah. which to the point that you made earlier, she did five seasons on a very, very successful show. And she stopped acting after that to take care of their child. Um, I know that it was implied that she knew about him having affairs and yeah. whatnot but she did a, she did file for the divorce so yeah. whether or not she knew she was okay with the affairs or not she filed for the divorce which suggests to me that she was not happy with with his behavior in the relationship so i think that that's a fact we can hang our hats on yes right whatever that means to her great and i can understand if you'd given up your career to raise a child with this man and then whatever happened that made you want to divorce him happened there's a lot of that that could breed a lot of bitterness a lot of bad feelings and that says to me I understand then even after getting you know falling into the you know um uh, the syndication deal with the NBC money, getting those millions of dollars, that she still would want to put up those film film reels to try and make more money, A, potentially to shame him in some way, and B, because she's being vindictive and it's like, I want to take him for everything I can get. Like, that's a vitriol that I buy. 
Yeah. Because, again, and I, it's hard to know whether or not she knew about the other se- sex with the other women, but, again, to me, because she had given up her career for their family and she was the one who filed for divorce, that suggests to me that there could be a very large amount of bitterness there, um, which makes sense. But, again, I also agree, um, did she hire someone, you know? And then the last thing I thought was, is it possible that John killed Bob but then also killed someone else and the other person's blood was in the car? Is it possible that John and Bob did something to someone together, this unknown male? And they were fighting the night before because they were like, what the fuck happened? Did they get into a fight? They're out at a bar. They're flirting with some ladies. They know Bob from TV. The ladies are going crazy. And one of the ladies' husbands comes over and is not taking kindly to it. Do they get into a terrible fist fight or argument or whatever? Do things escalate? Who knows? You know, is, it, did something happen to some, Again, if there was seven bits of blood in that car, is it possible is my point. That's the only other theory I came up with, that Bob and John did something together that was extreme. And because we know there's another person's unknown person's blood in that car did they potentially kill somebody together or do something bad to somebody together and then john was like i i can't risk i can't risk this coming out or i can't risk getting caught and so then killed bob that's the only other possibility i can think of it's more than possible i like all of this in as much as i can like it of course. um one thing I'm going to add, and you'll love what I'm choosing to add, too. Please. Um, George Foreman had seven daughters. One of them is named Georgetta. And that feels like, again, we're getting into another territory. This is George. something else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, I have one uh, uh, just brief tidbit about uh, Bob Crane that I did not put in the episode, and I probably should have, but I feel like it fits in with the profile that you were uh, Ooh, please. coming with. Yes. Back when he was working in radio, like in some of the earlier days, two weeks before Valentine's Day, he gets on the horn, if we call it that. <laughs> Does do radio call it the horn? I think the horn's a phone, isn't it? Doesn't matter. Yeah. He gets on the radio and he asks the female audience to send valentine's day kisses to him in the mail so the second day after he has said this they start getting letters cards gifts all of this stuff sent to the station all with like lipstick kisses covering the outside of these packages thousands of deliveries came in to the point the post office was like, this is not sanitary. We cannot do this anymore for the love of God, stop. But he just kept like, every day was like, send me kisses. And it's like, what is a bigger, like, I need your adoration than send me your literal kiss. Send me your literal adoration. And it's like, okay, Bob Crane, were you a classically handsome gentleman? Sure, I guess. You are no Elvis Presley, so reel it back. You know, Elvis Presley could get away with that, like, send me your kisses, but we don't have time to get into the negative things about Elvis, so we'll leave it there. Yeah. (laughs) But you know, and I'm glad you brought that up, because that one other thing that I forgot to mention, listen, to your point, if he if everybody is consenting and and everyone is legally aged then then it is everybody's right and it's not our business yeah the cheating again if 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 he was cheating on his wives and certainly to that extent um well to any extent but 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 meaning like filming yourself like having proof floating out there when you have many children and you have you know wives and ex-wives etc yeah um is really risky when you're somebody who's also on television, who's also famous, who's a, a person of note. You risk yeah. putting your family at a huge opportunity for um, massive, massive embarrassment. So I do, I do just say again, like it is to me, t- it does toe a line where I'm like, 
You could have had sex with all of those women. That's your prerogative. But you had to film all of it and take photographs of all of it, et cetera. That is a risky move. Yeah. That's a, that's a fact because who knows who can get their hands on what. And again, I, I just think that's a fact. Yeah. So again, to me, that speaks to either a risk-taking uh, trait that he has or a, a disregard for those kinds of, like he didn't care. It was more important to him to have those. Sure. But here's the only other thing I'll say. People get famous and like, you know, let's use like, I'll use rock star Tommy Lee, for example, because I don't think he'd be offended by me using him as an example. Wow. Okay. Um, you know, um, those, those, uh, those guys, they go for it. And again, yeah. great. That's their prerogative, et cetera. But it's, it's again, to me, there's something about like, but could you not? have sex unless you were filming it or taking photos like it is did you require that aspect because it's one thing to just be like I'm famous and I'm gonna have sex with every single woman I can it's another to be like I need to photograph and videotape myself having sex with every possible woman I can do you know what I mean it just takes a bit of a different tone for me um, yeah. And listen, we don't know if he was having sex with women that he also didn't f- film and, and photograph. So that's also possible. But when it, it just seems like the numbers were, were pretty high. It's just interesting to me that like that's again to me where there's a line that's questionable. Because even like again like Tommy Lee, God bless, who I have nothing about. I feel like even he would say like, man, that's a little extreme. Do you know what I mean? Like, he, he is some pretty – fucking extreme stories when they were in the in their heyday um but then the only other thing that i thought of was to like and i say this with no crassness yeah. but this was 1978 yeah this man was almost 50 now i am not suggesting that that men in their 50s can't have extremely high sex drives they can but science speaking your sex drive and etc does start to dwindle in uh, typically again i'm not saying across the board but the only other thing, did they do any talk screen on him? Is Did he have any drugs in his system at the time of his death? Because the only other thing that came into my mind was, was he taking, like, cocaine to for stamina, et cetera? Because this is at a sure. time before things like Viagra and Cialis and all of the above. Yes. Was he using a, you know, recreational drug to help him in the bedroom, for example? Because then, if we're getting into the drug world, then it could be a money debt then it could be sure. pissing somebody off, or et cetera. That was the last thing I, I wanted to ask. Yes. Um, there was no tox panel with the uh-huh. autopsy, but from everything I have read, he was no drugs, no alcohol. He was just high on Bob Crane 24-7, like. Well, that almost, I'm going to be honest, feels more troubling. <laughs> you know, like, it's like, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I This, I mean, this one really fascinates me. Yeah. It really, really fascinates me. Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, it, it is, it, is it possible that he was getting older and that's part of the reason he was like, I'm going to, like, kind of bow out of this lifestyle because he was like, you know, to, qu- <laughs> to quote, uh, lethal weapon he was too old for this shit you know like is it possible he was just like i can't keep it up like it used to no pun intended there um and he was just like it's time to bow out gracefully before it gets embarrassing i mean well and also listen like of course there are the samantha jones in the world that you know don't want to settle down they want to keep going etc but he had settled down a couple of times he had this girlfriend in the end, um, you know, who, who very tragically found him uh, when he had passed. I don't know. I, I do, again, bringing it back to Tommy Lee. <laughs> Even Tommy Lee has settled down. Now, I don't know the ins and outs of their relationship or, or how it works or whatever, but it does feel like, you know, it's it's always a question to ask. Because, again, yeah. I'm not suggesting that it's like every person wants a typical relationship by any stretch right but it it is it is it does seem interesting that he was like i need to get counseling and i want to do this and again maybe maybe those days were or maybe it was just starting to not be fun anymore maybe it was like he finally had maybe he finally finally gotten his yayas out you know i mean i don't know yeah like he was 
like if it's if we're looking at like hundreds of women that sounds exhausting to me not interested and i get that you know i'm who, a different personality type you know who it doesn't sound exhausting to tommy lee <laughs> i like the quote of tommy something so extreme that even tommy lee would go oh that's too much man <laughs> I just I like again I feel like if he ever he will never hear this but I feel like if he did he'd be like she's right that's fair <laughs> <laughs> and I did fucked up shit you know what I mean like I feel like he would be yeah you know? yeah, yeah they're they're early years oh yeah hoo yeah. yeah hoo yeah well listen Christy Oxborough amazing work as always this was truly captivating I was hanging on your every word again I I am truly flummoxed I don't know uh, what uh, I don't know that I've ever used the word flummoxed on the show before I I guarantee you have not yeah yeah but (laughs) But uh, I like yes this is a confounding one and I'm, I'm glad we covered it because man oh man wild wild yeah it was just a roller coaster truly Um, listen, if you haven't given us a follow on social media yet, what are you doing? Go right now. Instagram at True Crime and Cocktails, Facebook, YouTube at the same, uh, Twitter at Not Detectives, uh, YouTube. Did I say YouTube already? I think I did. Wow. Did you? Not, not a drop, (laughs) but YouTube at at, at True Crime and Cocktails. Also, if you're feeling generous, head on over to uh, Apple Podcasts. Leave us a nice review. We've had a lot, we've had a real influx of the opposite so give us some love if you'd like to over there let's let's write these numbers um and if you're looking for some more content if this is not enough of these two chuckleheads go over to patreon patreon.com slash true crime and cocktails where we offer bonus episodes and live monthly q a's amongst other things also a, a poll every month that you can vote in to vote on an episode we do on the show once a month and there's uh, also on our highest tier there is a, a newsletter that young uh, Ms. Christy Oxborough puts out which is a real delight so that is a joy and a half over there and of course if you're looking for True Crime and Cocktails merch the only place to get it truecrewmerch.com so check that out as well Christy do you want to tell the people about next week's episode on the next True Crime and Cocktails Sid and Nancy. That's right. I know you're jazzed about this oh, one, and I I'm cannot jazzed. wait. Cannot wait. I uh, don't know a lot about this one either, just the bullet points, so I can't wait to get into it. Um, Christy, do you want to say goodnight to the people? Good night, Dick Van Dyke. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, Tommy Lee. <laughs> <laughs>